Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Uzumaki clan members see lol chakra in temple for Naruto. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Reaparophilance and link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. Chapter 1. Birth of a Swordsman. Welcome to Konoha and now we skip the blah 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 that all of you have read countless times. Let me just cut to the chase for you all. Ten years ago the Kyubi was released from Kishina Yuzumaki, the wife of the fourth Hokage, after giving birth to triplets, though the first named Naruto was born twenty minutes before the other two. And said fourth Hokage was forced to fight to save them before the third Hokage, Hiruzen Siratobi, attempted the Reaper Death Seal to seal away the Kyubi. However, he had attempted it on Naruto as he was eldest, but the boy's body rejected the Kyubi's chakra, and he was forced to seal the body in Naruto and its chakra into the two younger of the triplets. The second astonishing thing, Naruto's body rejecting the Kyubi was the first, was that the Shinigami gave Hiruzen a pass on summoning him, but it did weaken him slightly pushing his chakra reserves to that of a Jonin instead of a Sanin, which was counted as a fair trade. Anyway, for five years Kashina and Minato, the fourth Hokage, raised and treated their children equally, but that changed when the two younger children, Kiwan and Arashi, began exhibiting chakra and Kyubi's chakra, making them focus on them leaving poor Naruto alone. From there Naruto was essentially raised by the few friends he had. Makoto Uchiha, the Uchiha matriarch and clan head after her bastard of a husband was executed for treason, after he stole the forbidden scroll and tried to get the Uchiha clan to learn from it, Sarada and Sasuke Uchiha, Makoto's twin youngest children that were Naruto's age, Itomi Uchiha. Makoto's eldest and the youngest Anbu captain in history, Shizun, the apprentice of Naruto's godmother Tsunade, Aya Michiraku, a civilian Raymond chef that worked with her father, Yugao Yuzuki, one of his mother's students and an Anbu captain that specialized in swordsmanship, Hana Inuzuka, the daughter of Minato's teammate Tsum, Kurunai Yuhi, a young Chunin that specialized in Jinjutsu. Damari and Gara Sabaku, the oldest and youngest children of the Kazakiage that Naruto met when said man came for treaty talks, and Anko Midarashi, a young girl who was betrayed by her sensei Orochimaru and Naruto, treated as a friend, regardless of who else said anything. The worst part was that Naruto's godfather and godbrother neglected him too in favor of his siblings. Tsunade was innocent in the neglect as she was mostly too busy at the hospital with being the best doctor or training new doctors and medic nins to spend quality time with the trio, so she usually had Shizun give them their gifts during holidays or events, or Naruto would get his by stopping by to see her. Naruto never told Tsunade about the neglect as he knew she saw Kashina as a daughter and didn't want to wreck that relationship for Tsunade. Moving on, we come to you ten years into Naruto's life because we find him packing his things that he kept at the Ichiha compound. The reason for his packing was because he was planning to leave the village after finally getting fed up with everything and knew he needed to. You see, he felt that he wouldn't receive the training he would need as a shinobi if he stayed and he was right. His friends taught or helped him with what they could, but with their individual schedules, it wasn't a ton and a few days ago when Naruto learned tree climbing on his own. He showed it off to his family only to have his father and mother scream at him, and his mother actually slapped him and sent him to his room, which he rarely slept in anyway, and that was the last straw for Naruto, as he blew up at them and tore into them about hating them and how he wished he was never made part of their family before leaving. It was two days ago that he overheard a samurai that was guarding the fire daimyo on one of his many visits, talking about how Iron Country had the greatest swordsmen and fighters in general that could stand up to any ninja. It was yesterday that he told his friends, which included Hiruzen though the man was more focused on his own grandson than on Naruto, that he was planning to leave and go to Iron Country and train till he was 16, so he could be adequately trained and prepared for his life. His friends understood, though Sarada, Kurunai, Hana, Yugao, and Anko made him blush when they kissed his cheeks and asked him to be careful, while Itomi was going to have one of her larger crow summons transport him most of the way, then have some of the lesser ones watch over him until he got settled in Iron Country. So now we have him packing up some things including some jutsu scrolls from Hiruzen and Makoto, because he was currently leaving one week after he turned 10, and once again, his friends were the only ones who got him anything. Anyway, once he finished packing he was leaving straight from the compound to Fang Country, Iron Country's southern border country, and then begin the journey to Iron Country and its capital. I'll be surprised if they notice I'm gone. Naruto thought absently as he finished packing up his things and went out to the living room where the people he counted as friends were waiting for him with sad expressions. So I guess you're leaving now, right? Mikoto asked and Naruto nodded with a small smile before he gave her a hug. Yeah, but don't worry I'll be back in a few years. He stated with a grin only to be poked in the back and he turned to see Sarada there with her arms crossed. You'd better be. 
Sarada stated pouting making the others laugh before Naruto hugged each of them and gave Sarada, Kurinai, Hana, Anko, and Yuga a kiss to the cheek, making them blush before he left with Itomi. Once they were in a secure area, Naruto turned to Itomi, can you deliver this when it's time please? He asked giving her a scroll, and Itomi nodded and called a large crow. Naruto then kissed Itomi's cheek before hopping on her waiting summons before flying off, well off to make my destiny. Naruto thought as he rode the crow to Fang Country, while well, Itomi waited till the time was right to deliver the scroll. Hours later. It took Naruto four hours to reach Fang, and the crow, named Kara, was kind enough to carry him to the border of Iron Country before leaving, and two smaller crows came and settled on Naruto's shoulders as he walked across the border heading for the capital. Which in and of itself was a long journey, but it wouldn't be worth it if it was easy, since he assumed that the trip there was a way to prove himself. Around 12 hours later, Naruto made it to a large mountain that looked like a mushroom and began to scale it using his chakra and muscles. Six hours into that, he made to the top to see an older gentleman with robes marked with the rank of general standing there with a raised eyebrow as Naruto panted, my name is Naruto I came here to learn from the greatest swordsman and become the best. Naruto panted out trying to not collapse which wasn't easy since he ran low on chakra an hour ago and climbed the rest of the way on pure grit and will. The general, named Mifune, examined the boy before him and noted the bloodied fingers, you climbed up here with your bare hands. He asked incredulously and Naruto nodded surprising Mifune and his small group that were behind him, who Naruto missed from the exhaustion. I used chakra until I had nothing but my muscle left, then it was just my will to make it, since I had to do to it on my own no matter what. He stated still panting as he tried to stay standing, but his legs were shaking. Impressive. Mifune stated since it was difficult for an adult to get up the mountain, but for a child to do it, and the fact he was doing so to become better made him more impressive. Before he could make another comment, Naruto passed out, and Mifune had one of his soldiers carry him to one of the hotels. Next day. The next morning had Mifune and one of his captains, a man named Mihik, walking to the room Naruto was resting in only to hear grunts of exertion coming from within. Being curious, they opened to the door to see Naruto doing vertical push-ups while having weights connected to his legs. They were impressed as many adults couldn't do this exercise, and here was a boy not even in his teens doing it as if he'd been doing it for years, unknown to them he had been. I can see why you were interested, Mifune Sama. Mihik stated as he hadn't seen one so young be so dedicated to his training, and it was even more astounding he was doing this after climbing the mountain the day before. Mifune merely nodded, yes, if he's this dedicated now, I can only imagine what he will be like when older. Mifyun stated before Naruto noticed them there and stopped before releasing the weights with a dull thud, before sealing them into a scroll and faced the two. Can I help you? Naruto asked trying to be polite and civil, since they were nice enough to give him a room, plus they'd hopefully be training him. Come with me young man, there is a few things I'd like to talk to you about. Mifyun stated motioning Naruto to come with him. Alright. Naruto stated as he got his shoes on before going with the two to a more regal building, where several individuals with different swords were training along with a couple of others. When they saw Mifune, they all stopped and bowed to him before looking at Naruto who was showing no fear, even with the stares from a few who had a more predatory gaze, good day all of you, this is the boy I was telling you about. Mifune stated making them raise their eyebrows, and Naruto gave a slight bow of respect, but they saw it was not of submission, making him go up a notch in their book, putting him at notch one. Hello, my name is Naruto. I have two clan names, but only one holds any real significance to me. Naruto informed making a few rays and eyebrow at that. What is your full name? One of the others, a guy with green hair and three swords, asked and Naruto frowned slightly. My full name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, but I only care about the Uzumaki part of my name. He stated and they widened their eyes at the Uzumaki name more than the Namikaze name. They are related to the Red Death. A man with red hair and a cross car on his cheek asked and Naruto sighed and nodded. Yeah, she's my mother, not like she treats me like it though. Naruto stated bitterly getting their attention even more. Why not? Another with blonde hair and a cigarette that was doing leg exercises asked. Naruto scoffed, she's too busy focusing on my siblings. Naruto stated angrily, for five years both of my parents ignored me and only focused on my siblings, and then when I learned to walk vertically they flipped out and Kashina actually slapped me for it. So now I've broken ties with the men will be my own self and Yuzumaki. He stated angrily since he was going to be the greatest Yuzumaki to ever live and take the clan to great heights once he learned how to become clan head of the Yuzumaki. He broke from his musings by Mifune speaking, well young one, you must have a lot of heart and courage to scale the mountain as you did, and he fact you have a fire in your eyes when you spoke about becoming stronger, and the greatest is a good testament to your will. With that in mind, you may stay here for a month, and if you show promise then you may stay here and learn as long as you wish. 
your teachers will be myself and any who wish to teach you, but be warned that we will not go easy on you, as the life of a swordsman is not easy, and we will require dedication and willingness to continue on through it all. He stated seriously while looking Naruto in the eye, and Naruto just stared back at him with absolute confidence and will to be the best. I accept, sensei. Naruto stated seriously giving a respectful bow making the swordsman and others smile. Now the tour I mean training could begin. One month later. Naruto was taking a few breaths as he was working on a technique called cutting nothing, that is Sensei Mihikin Senpai's Oro, the green-haired man with three swords from when he met the others, were teaching him. He was getting the hang of it, but was struggling since it was considered a more advanced technique, and the fact he had to control himself and his sword to the point that he could only cut when he wanted to cut wasn't helping. His teachers were saying he was making progress, but Naruto wanted to be even better, which was why he planned to try out Shadow Clones soon to help increase his training. He mentally reminded himself to thank Itomi for teaching him that since it was helpful for chores, and he planned to try out the training aspect. Unknown to Naruto, there were several of the other swordsmen paying attention to him, since he showed such grit and determination in his training, since he trained till he could barely stand, and the minute he had his energy back he would return to training and wouldn't try to learn anything new until he mastered what he already knew. Such dedication and focus was rare in one so young, and it only made them more interested. Meanwhile, the Namaka's family were having a normal meal with Yureya, Tsunade, Kakashi, and Shizun not having noticed anything different, except for Shizun of course, until the young female Namaka's, named Kiwon, spoke up, oh. Tausen, Kasen, our teacher wanted to know where Naruto was, have you seen him? She asked making them all stop as they, minus Shizun, began to realize they hadn't seen Naruto in a while. Trying to hide their panic, Minato and Kashina quickly moved to their eldest room, only to freeze as they realized that they hadn't been in there before, and tried to push down the sense of foreboding, while not noticing the others had joined them. Minato opened the door and found the place covered with dust, while it was sparsely decorated as all that was there was a chair, bed, and desk with nothing else at all. Naturally, this shocked everyone but Shizun before Minato noticed a scroll on the desk and felt fear rush through him as he went to it and noticed it was dated a month ago, making his heart sink as he opened it and read before his eyes widened as tears flowed down his face and he fell to his knees while punching the desk repeatedly till he finally broke it shocking everyone before the scroll fell. From his hand and rolled to the others with Kashina picking it up and the others read it widening their eyes as they did. Whoever finds this first, by the time you've read this, I will be long gone to a place I know won't neglect me when I want to train, won't choose someone else to train instead of me, just because they feel they may need more training for a stupid reason, and won't get angry at me and berate me for learning something on my own. I am forsaking the Namaka's name, and will now be in Yuzumaki only, and will not return unless I deem it necessary. If you are wondering why my room looks this way. It's because I haven't been living at the house since I was seven and have stayed with those that I consider my actual family and friends and kept the few things they gave me since I was never given anything by my so-called family or god relatives after the age of five. If you are hoping that if I come back, you can claim you noticed I was gone right away, you can forget that because I had a seal on the letter that triggers when you opened it so I know exactly when you opened it and know how long it took you to finally realize I was gone. If I had to guess, I would say at least three weeks and it wasn't even any of you that noticed I was gone, but someone who couldn't help but notice such as one of the academy instructors. Hope you all enjoy the life you clearly wanted. One without me in it. Signed Naruto Uzumaki. Everyone was shocked at what they read, and Kashina dropped to her knees, shocked at how her oldest child felt and was starting to feel like shit for how she acted. The others did as well except for Shizun, for obvious reasons, and Tsunade since this was the first time being at their home in over a year, and as we stated before she rarely saw the triplets as it was, so there was no absence for her to notice. The day she just assumed Naruto was at a friend's house, since he had mentioned he ate meals with friends during his visits to her which at times were months of time between. However, she was feeling a strong emotion right now, and it was anger. Anger at Jureya for neglecting their oldest godson, anger at Kakashi and Minato for doing exactly what they preached against, meaning showing favoritism, the siblings for not being there for their brother, and mostly at Kishina, for daring to go against Yuzumaki laws, rules, and principles, by basically abandoning her child, clansman, and the rightful heir to the Yuzumaki. Tsunade glared at Kashina and slapped her across the face, before leaving with Shizun in tow, while Minato quickly had Kakashi go and get Anbu to try and track Naruto, futile as it was since the trail would be a month old. Three months later. Naruto stood facing a muscled youth with white guy pants, bandages around his lower legs and feet, and slipper-style sandals, and both were panting and covered in bruises. This was Sanisuke Sagara, a Tajutsu fighter nicknamed the Steel Wall, since that's what it felt like to hit him, and the fact that he could take life-threatening injuries and keep going. 
Naruto was training in his style of fighting after learning the personal close combat style of his third sword teacher Seito Hajim, after Naruto learned the different styles of the sword art Katatsu. Naruto's natural brawler style is what attracted Sanosuke, since he fought pretty much the same way, and since he had a lightning-fast way of fighting due to Seito, Sanosuke decided Naruto needed a style that would let him take numerous hits and still keep going, plus it would let him train harder in his sword training if he could take more hits without having to stop. Once Naruto finished training with Sanosuke, he was going to train with a pair of people named Edward Kenway and Shea Cormac, who were both elite swordsmen, but also stealth, tracking, assassination, and long-range experts, and he was going to learn their multiple methods and combat styles, since Edward used two swords, and Shea used a sword and dagger combo. Naruto had also began to successfully use shadow clones to train faster and more effectively, while mentally thanking Itomi for teaching him the jutsu, but each time he got a new sensei he'd train with them solo first for at least a month, then he'd work with shadow clones, since he wanted to show that he was taking things seriously and not just trying to rush through everything. Now, don't go thinking he had mastered everything from his other teachers, heck no, but he was having clones train in them and make sure he had them down easily and would then work on being flawless and effective with them all before he moved to new attacks, stances, and the like. He was working harder this month than the others since Mihik had informed him that in two months' time, they would be going to Yuzu to see if anything remained there that Naruto could learn or use. Naruto was excited, naturally, and thought hoped there would be things even Kishina didn't know, since he planned to remove her and her children from the Uzumaki clan if he was able to become the Uzumaki clan head. Another thing on his mind was he still needed to find what sword was his ideal sword. He had styles for katanas and zambados, but the swords didn't resonate with him, and he was trying to find one that did while also keeping his skills with the other blades, since if he found himself without his ideal blade, then he'd be stuck with an unfamiliar weapon, and that could lead to his death. Naruto shook his head to clear those thoughts, since he had plenty of time to worry about that, and resumed his training with Sanosuke, which was essentially the two beating the hell out of each other. Two months later. In the land of whirlpools, Naruto, now looking more fit and carrying a pair of wakizashis to get used to their feel and weight, since he began training with another warrior named Ayashi Shimamori along with his other teachers, and it was coming along well. His training with Sanosuke was to the point Naruto was learning to use the Feudy no Kiwami or Double Layer Limit, which was a powerful and destructive ability that could cause damage on the scale of Tsunade's punches without the strength behind them. With his swordsman senseis he had already mastered half the techniques they wanted to show him and get him to learn, and he was working on making his own and learning some advanced moves. The main two he was having difficulty with were the height Mitsurugi and Gatatsu, since both required great leg and arm strength to do the fast motions and cutting stabbing power. The present, Naruto, Mihik, and Naruto's next Tajutsu sensei named Sanji, were in Whirlpool to begin looking around and training. Naruto felt strange there as even though it was destroyed, his mind could envision it in its prime with various civilians, merchants, shinobi, and samurai walking the streets going about their daily lives. It actually pulled at something inside him, and he decided to check the clan head cage tower in the center of the village. Mihik and Sanji merely took in the sights and let Naruto look around as they set up somewhere for them to camp, as they didn't know how long they'd be there. Back with Naruto, he entered the tower which was still in good shape and found himself heading for the office and looking around to see many skeletal remains of different shinobi wearing headbands, not from Yuzu or Konoha, and it was only one with an Yuzu headband for every 15 or so that had a different headband. It was a clear testament to how strong his clan was during the height of their power, and it made Naruto happy to know his clan was made of hard-working powerful people, since they were only one clan and had made a village that could be on par with Konoha and the other great villages. Upon reaching the office, Naruto found a mountain of bodies and one skeleton wearing cage robes sitting in the cage chair, which Naruto assumed meant that the person defeated all the enemies that came for him before succumbing to his wounds. Naruto then looked around the office before finding a picture that was hanging wrong and moved it to find a safe with a seal over it that Naruto knew as a blood seal. Shrugging to himself, Naruto cut his finger and put blood on the seal, making a glow before it faded away and unlocked the safe, causing the door to open and show a blade and large scroll resting inside the safe. Taking the blade, he unsheathed it and found it was a straight-backed kukri sword that had seals inscribed on the handle and blade, and Naruto felt a connection to it and gave it a few test swings and noticed it seemed to hum when he swung it in a certain direction but stopped as soon as he moved it. He frowned in confusion before he resheathed it and put the scabbard across his back before taking the scroll. As he unrolled it on the desk, which was somehow still intact, he read from the last cage, to whoever finds this, I pray to Kami that you are in Yuzumaki as I do not wish for our enemies or those who would exploit us to find the treasures you now hold. The sword is one three weapons that have served the Yuzumaki since its founding and is one of the determining factors of being the clan head of the Yuzumaki. 
the sword's name is Orcris the Strong Cleaver, and its mates are within the village, waiting for those worthy to find them, and will most assuredly lead you, if you are a pure-blooded Yuzumaki, and are strong enough to wield them properly. I was not strong enough, kind enough, or wise enough to be the clan head, but I was still made cage, and did not fight to become the clan head, as only the items can pick who is to lead our clan. One item will judge your soul, and another will judge your ambitions and goals to see if you are worthy, while the weapons will test your strength both of your heart, mind, and body. Only the true leader of the Yuzumaki has the strength of mind, body, and heart, while having the pure soul and good intentions for the Yuzumaki. The scroll you found is the entire history of the Yuzumaki, since its founding along with every jutsu the Yuzumaki have created, the weapon styles designed, and how to bring out the bloodlines of our clan to their strongest potential through training, practice, and perseverance, as every Yuzumaki does. Our religious practices, beliefs, cooking, culture, festivals, and more that our clan honored, cherished, and kept sacred, are within as well and must be protected. The scroll also details every notable Yuzumaki that has come from the clan, regardless of if they were exiled from the clan or not. Please, even if you are not the clan head, protect the scroll and keep our clan's history and culture alive for the next generation to learn and practice. Never let the whirlpool stop raging, Menmi Yuzumaki, Yuzukage of the village hidden in the whirlpools. Naruto read and smiled seeing how feared and dedicated his clan was to preserving their history and culture for the others, and began looking at the rest of the scroll. Further in the scroll was the seal that contained the history of the Yuzumaki dating back to within 100 years after the Sage of Six Paths, and mentioned all the notable clansmen that came to be over the centuries up to when the Yuzumaki were nearly wiped out with Whirlpool. Naruto sealed the scroll away for later, and then left the tower with his new sword out to guide him where the item attracting it was. An hour later had him at what appeared to be a barracks of some kind that was still in decent shape. Upon entering it, he found piles of corpses from the attackers and a small number of scattered Yuzumaki defenders. Naruto walked past saying prayers for the dead before entering the captain's quarters and found a strong box under the desk that had the captain sitting in front of it. Naruto moved the captain gently before taking the box out and broke the lock and opened it finding a short sword that was just under 22 inches long on the blade with a curved up crossguard, a grooved silver pommel, and a leather wrapped spiral handle. The short sword like Storm Cleaver had seals engraved on it and he could make out an inscription that the seals made, a charn. The lighting blade. Naruto strapped the blade to his waist and pointed Orcrist around in different directions looking for the hum, but the blade remained still. Frowning in confusion, he sheathed it before a thought occurred to him. He looked at a charn and pulled it out and pointed it in different directions before feeling it hum and left the barracks to follow it while mentally making a note to send some clones here to bury the dead. Another two hours of walking later, Naruto came upon what he assumed was the clan head cage home, if the reinforced walls and dozens upon dozens of ruined seals were anything to go by and entered before looking around. Upon finding the office, Naruto looked around finding papers and books thrown everywhere and a rusted bastard sword hanging on the wall, and Sting was reacting to it. Shrugging to himself, Naruto sheathed Sting and approached the sword, and upon grasping the handle, the seals engraved on it glowed before the rust fell from the blade, like it was nothing but dust, and revealed a shimmering silver blade. Upon the crossguard were seals that made another inscription, Glamdring. The Thunder Hammer. Naruto looked around the office and found a scabbard for the blade, and strapped it on his back just under Orcrist, before looking around some more to find anything else of use or important. Finding everything that was useful, Naruto saw it was getting dark and decided to find his teachers, who were setting up camp in the middle of the village. Upon arriving they instantly noticed the weapons on Naruto and Mihik smiled, I see that the coming here wasn't a waste. Mihik stated and Naruto nodded. Yeah, and there is still more for me to find here so we may be here a while. Naruto stated making Mihik nod as Sanji gave them soup before they ate quietly before turning in for the night. The next day, Naruto continued to explore the village for any signs or clues on what he was looking for or where he should look. It was nearly noon when he came upon what looked like an old temple and decided to look inside, since there was an item supposed to judge his soul. He scowled slightly seeing the bodies of attackers and those in Yuzumaki robes that resembled priest garments, and said another prayer over them before continuing to explore while mentally noting to send out shadow clones that night to begin burying the bodies, even the enemy shinobi, since he wasn't going to disrespect the dead, regardless of how he felt about them. As he finished that thought, he felt a pull towards the main room and followed it to find a statue of an Yuzumaki, evidenced by the Yuzumaki spiral being engraved on the forehead, wearing robes and holding a shikujo staff, and wearing a rosary of black magnetama and crimson Yuzumaki spirals with a large black and red Yuzumaki spiral at the end. The interesting thing was that both the staff and rosary weren't part of the statue, but placed on in it to secure them. Naruto idly wondered how the hell no one took them before he paused in thought and drew Orchrist and re-examined the seals on it. 
He found what he was looking for etched into the hilt so small that unless you looked for it, you would miss it. It was a reverse summoning seal. If anyone not of Yuzumaki blood tried to use it and was deemed unworthy, then the blade would reverse summon itself back into the safe Naruto took it from, and even if there was Yuzumaki blood, if deemed unworthy the blade wouldn't work except as a blunt object. Testing a theory Naruto found the same kind of sea latched onto a charn and glamdring, though he guessed they went to different locations to ensure no one could hide all three from any surviving Yuzumaki, and assumed the same was for the staff and rosary. Naruto made a mental note to swipe some blood on the reverse seals to see if they would activate and make the weapon return to him instead of here in Whirlpool, since it would be troublesome to keep coming back and getting them if someone else tried to use them. Naruto then looked at the statue and bowed to it, please protect these items, I will not desecrate something sacred to my clan just to gain something from it. Naruto stated before turning to leave only to feel a weight on his neck and something in his hand, and sure enough as soon as he looked he was wearing the rosary and holding the staff. He turned back to the statue and saw the hands were now together in a prayer or a sign of respect, with the head bowed, and he bowed towards it again, I will honor these items, and the Uzumaki clan writes so long as I shall live. He stated as he sealed the staff in his arm and walked out of the temple with the rosary sizing itself to fit him better. Naruto walked out and sighed slightly, he had most of what he needed to be the Uzumaki clan head, but being recognized as such was another matter entirely. He knew if worst came to worst, he'd have to enact the clan survival act, which was a law created by the first Hokage, and subsequently picked up by all the other villages, that if the last member of a clan was considered underage and took the clan head seat, then they had to be 16 and have one wife by the time they were 18 to continue the clan's legacy and bloodline. The first part was easy, but finding a wife in two years after he took the head position would be another matter entirely, and that was if he was done training by the age of 16. Naruto shook those thoughts away and quickly made several hundred clones, who nodded and began gathering the dead, while twenty went to find a clearing to bury them in. While they did that, Naruto went about looking through the village for what was left to prove him worthy of being the Uzumaki clan head. He wandered for most of the day only stopping when Sanji tracked him down and made him eat as he wanted to find the last item before they were done on the island. Naruto knew he could get a week to stay here, but any longer would be harder, and he wanted to have the security now if he could have it, rather than have to come back and take more time away. He'd rather come back here some time for the peace and quiet and pay his respects, rather than because he wanted something from the land. He paused a moment as he felt something call to him for a minute there, and looked around trying to determine where it was coming from, and finally pinpointed it at the island's mountain. Shrugging to himself, he took off towards the mountain making some more clones to help out the others, as he found several remains still scattered everywhere. Upon reaching the mountain, Naruto began looking over the area around it, having guessed that the mountain was where the civilians were to evacuate to when an attack came. Twenty minutes of searching led to him finding a seal carved into a small unassuming rock, and he activated making a cavern entrance appear with torches lighting themselves down the cavern. Naruto quickly entered and followed the tunnel, feeling the call get stronger now the deeper he went. Naruto arrived at the vast cavern looking on in sadness at the bodies of the various civilians, ninja, and invaders, and quickly made several hundred clones to begin taking the bodies up, while another popped, so the clones preparing the graves would know to dig more. As his clones began doing their job, Naruto began looking around and an hour of searching, as the cavern was that large, Naruto found a small patch of dirt that was more disheveled than the rest and quickly wiped some away, revealing a small box. Naruto pulled it out and opened it showing an onyx band with a ruby on top, but the interesting thing was that the onyx flowed up making the spirals in the ruby, and the ruby flowed down making vein-like designs in the onyx. Naruto slipped it on his right middle finger and felt a power wash over him, and the ruby glowed a moment before it faded, and Naruto sighed, you don't accept me huh? Very well, then I shall carry you till you find someone who is. Naruto stated as he slipped the ring off and put it in his pocket. Naruto trudged back to the campsite and sighed making the other two look at him, something wrong Naruto. Sanji asked as he cooked their dinner. The last item of the Uzumaki clan head rejected me, so I can't be clan head. Naruto stated making them raise an eyebrow. You can still be clan head, who cares if the item didn't accept you, the others did. Sanji stated and Naruto shook his head, not noticing the ring began to glow again. I don't want to just take the title, I want to fully earn the right and title. Anything else is a sham and insult to my goals and dreams. Even if I can't banish her and her children from the Uzumaki, I will still refuse to be under the same name as them, as they broke key Uzumaki tenets and creeds, and my own views and code for life. Anything less than earning the right she claims to have without going through the proper procedures makes me no better than she is, and I refuse to stoop to her level and betray the very foundations my clan is built on just to get a shot at her. 
I will either find another way to get her out of the clan, or I will simply build my own and return these items to rest here in Yuzu for all time where no one will ever disturb them again. Naruto stated before he blinked and saw the ring back on his finger and the ruby glowing brightly making him smile, but it looks like it won't come to that. He stated gazing at the ring, with this I am marked as the true heir and leader of the Uzumaki clan. Naruto stated making a fist feeling the ring flood his mind with knowledge of his clan and their laws. Mihik and Sanji merely smirked as Sanji served the food, yes, well your lordship it's time to eat. Sanji stated jokingly making Naruto open his eyes and smirk as they sat down and ate with Naruto, now having the security and knowledge he needed to get back at the family who wronged him and punish the people who betrayed the clan and all it stood for. Five and one half years later. Capital of Iron Country. Plang. 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 Fame from the training area of the capital as a now 16-year-old Naruto clashed against Seito Hajim, Kenshin Mamura, and Mihik with his own blades, and right now Orchrist was out as it was his most fluid blade. Naruto had gone through some changes over the past few years, as he was 6'3 and all muscle with a six-pack, turning eight-pack forming on his torso. His hair was longer reaching the base of his neck and was slicked back save for one strand that hung between his eyes, and some of his strands had red tips. He still wore the rosary around his neck and was currently shirtless as he fraught his primary senseis in a pair of black guy pants and sandals. Around the area were the various warriors that had trained Naruto over the years counting Mifune, and among them were some of their most legendary warriors, such Cloud Strife, Sephiroth, Lin Yubai, Alter IBN Lahid, Ezio Auditor, Connor Kenway, Zer Zero, Squall Leonhardt, Geralt of Rivia, Ayashi Shimamori, Samsu Kazan, Sajuro Haiko, Kenpachi Zaraki, Anakin Skywalker, a man named only Jack. A large redhead nicknamed the Scotsman, and more. All of them had a hand in training Naruto at some point or another and could honestly say they'd never had a better student and it was also a little scary how good he had become in just over six years of training with them and how many different styles he learned. Naturally they weren't the only ones that were watching since Naruto had attracted the attention of several women in the land of iron just being himself and the women were ready go with him wherever he may go, with one already being his betrothed. The lady girl in question was one Rukia Kachiki as the two had known each other since he was training under her father by Akia to learn their speed techniques that were on par with Kenshin's height and Mitsurugi, though another of Naruto's girls was even better at the speed technique than any Kachiki and was only matched by Naruto. And the two had started as rivals until that grew to friendship and then furthered as any old love story went. The interesting thing was that Rukia was the one who wanted Naruto to date other girls, since she was friends with the ones she had met and didn't want them heartbroken, and apparently she liked the idea of having a husband that could handle multiple women and still be ready for more fun. Ayakuya was against it first, but when he was caught in a situation with Naruto having his sword at his throat and Rukia having hers at his manhood along with the other women in position to harm him in ways only Jiraiya could probably sympathize with, he made the intelligent decision of stating that so long as his daughter was happy then that was all that mattered. Since then he had been getting to know each woman, but at the moment Rukia was the only one he was to wed. Back to the other things, Naruto had mastered each skill his teachers had to give him including Edward, Shay, Ezio, Alter, and Connor's stealth, assassination, and tool skills to make sure he would be an effective shinobi as well as swordsman. He also got trained by some monks of Fire Temple that traveled at Mifune's request, and they taught him to fight with his shikujo, as well as their own form of hand-to-hand -hand combat, to add to his repertoire of skills. The monks were very eager to help him since apparently the only other monks they respected as much as they did the samurai were the Uzumaki clan monks who gave them the basis for their faith and practices. Naturally, this made Naruto even more eager to learn from them, and they were impressed and amazed at his dedication, restraint, and discipline, since it was something unseen in anyone let alone one not even to the age of 16. One major benefit he gained from them was learning to fight without his eyes, so he had one advantage over any enemies that came after him with the intent to blind him. Back to the fight, the three master swordsmen were actually having to work to gain any ground, as Naruto proved he was worthy of his nickname the Sage of Swords, as he had quick grasp of any blade he picked up and could be swinging it with little to no difficulty within hours, without using shadow clones. As a result it was very hard to attack him with a move he hadn't already mastered, learned to counter for, or learned to dodge while turning it to his advantage. For instance when Seito would come in with a Gatatsu thrust, Naruto would duck at the last second and grab Seito's sword arm and slam him into the ground before dodging as Kenshin or Mihik would come in to ensure Seito wasn't taken out of the fight. For Kenshin, certain height and Mitsurugi moves needed him to take a step in advance and Naruto would strike at that moment and keep him from getting firm footing for the attack and begin his own barrage of attacks, with the other two moving to help. For Mihik it was a matter of redirecting, countering blocking, or engaging him in close combat with his blades, like he wasn't fighting as a swordsman which threw Mihik off slightly. 
At the moment, Sato was a bit scuffed up, Mihik had some cuts in his clothes and a bruise on the right side of his face from a vicious right hook from Naruto, and Kenshin had cuts and tears in his kimono, and all three were panting, while Naruto stood with Orcris pointed towards the sky in front of his face and didn't seem to be breathing hard at all. It was clear to everyone that they had basically made an unbeatable swordsman, and with his other skills handy, he could be a force to reckon with, even for S-ranked enemies which was who he was facing right now. His training with Seino, Kenpachi, the monks, and those like them, made him a proverbial steel wall of muscle and nearly unbreakable when in combat, his training with Seito, Ayashi, Kenshin, and Baikuya made him a speed demon, his training with Shay, Edward, Connor, Alter, and Ezio made him a ghost when needed. Sanji and two others gave him an unorthodox method of fighting in hand-to-hand -hand that kept an enemy guessing, Mihik, the monks, and Mifune gave him focus, discipline, and sharpened him into a prime example of a swordsman while keeping emotions in check. And all of it only piled onto his already impressive stamina, making him able to outlast any opponent, and that wasn't even taking into account the jutsu he learned over the years, both from what he had with him and what he learned from the Uzumaki scrolls. In short, they'd made the perfect fusion of a monk, soldier, samurai, fighter, assassin, ninja, and warrior, and the boy still had years to grow before he hit his prime. It was almost scary how skilled the boy was, and he still wanted to become even greater and surpass every swordsman that had ever lived. They honestly believed he could do it especially Mifune since he knew that if Naruto wanted he could have the rank of general within a year if he joined the standing forces of iron, but he knew Naruto's goals and dreams had him going somewhere else in the world and he wasn't going to deny a boy he began to see as his own the dream he sought for and craved. Mifune already planned to go to Konoha for the upcoming Chunin exams if Naruto was going to compete as he wanted to watch with pride as everyone saw the diamond that most of Konoha foolishly neglected and tarnished. He broke from his musing seeing Naruto was getting ready to end it and quickly tapped his cane down on the ground, signaling the end of the fight, that's enough, I don't need you for getting too serious and someone losing a limb or worse. He called making them nod before Naruto gave his three senseis a salute which they all readily returned while the crowd applauded at the show. Naruto sheathed his blade and bowed to Mifune before activating a seal on his arm that put him in a pair of black pants, black boots, a red muscle shirt, and a black cloak with sage of swords, down the back of it in red, all of which were form-fitting and showed his defined muscles. Naruto then put Orcrist on his back and unsealed Glamdring and a charn and strapped them back on his person. Mifune then approached as Mihik, Kenshin, and Seito moved back to the others, Naruto, six years ago you came to us to become stronger and better yourself. I can state with utmost confidence that we have made you the strongest and the best, but there isn't anything left for you to learn here, and while I would be honored to count you among our forces, that is not where your dreams and goals lie elsewhere. Because of that we wish you well on your travels and know that you will always have a home and place here should you want it. If you stated with a smile fathers had when looking at their child accomplish something. Naruto stood straight and approached Mifun before embracing him like he was family, thank you, Mifun Jiji. He stated making Mifune smile and return the hug before patting him on the shoulder turned and marched off to continue his duties. Naruto nodded to the others as they either gave him pats on the back, nods of respect, or some other form of respect and caring in their own way. Naruto then felt someone press against his back and rub their hands on his chest, I guess that's his way of saying he's proud of you. He heard his fiance Rukia say while pressing her modest C cup breasts against his back, and he smiled. Yes. It's also his way of saying that if I ever need help, the army of this country is just a call away. Naruto stated before he turned and captured Rukia's lips in a kiss, making her moan as she wrapped her arms around his neck and deepened the kiss as Naruto moved his hand along her back, sending shivers up her spine. The two separated at a whine and looked to see Naruto's other girl standing there with a pout. Anahan Retsu, Ranjiku Matsumoto, Yuruchi Shion, Megumi Takani, Yumi Kamigata, Tifa Lockhart, Siri, Tris Marigold, and Yennefer. Rukia and Naruto smirked before he quickly made a group of clones, and each clone took a girl and gave them a passionate kiss that made their legs weak while Naruto kissed Rukia again. After about five minutes, the Naruto's separated from the girls, leaving them slightly dazed, and he smiled, pack your things, we leave in two days. He stated getting them out of their stupor before they nodded, and each gave a kiss to his cheek and swayed their hips as they walked to get their things making Naruto chuckle before he looked at the sky, get ready Konoha, Namikazes, I'm coming back, and you're not going to be happy with what I have to say and do. Naruto stated as the wind suddenly picked up and blew in the direction of Konoha. Naruto was going to bring his talent and power to Konoha, and he was going to ensure everyone on his shitlist was put on notice and made painfully aware of what they ignored or threw away. He wouldn't kill them, they hadn't earned that punishment or was it a mercy. Either way Naruto was going to show them how he grew away from them, away from their support, love, and any possible training they could have thought to give him. He just had to get him and his girls there to see it. Chapter 2. 
Return of the Maelstrom. Higher Country. Just outside Kanoha. Naruto and his girls were walking through the forest surrounding Kanoha, with the women taking in the sights, since they mostly lived in Iron Country, which was a lot of snow with some pop-ups of spring to enjoy, but not a full forest of summertime trees to see and experience. Naruto merely stared straight ahead towards the ever-nearing gate as they walked, though he did speak to his girls to ensure they didn't worry about him. They all understood why he was like this of course, he didn't want to go to Kanoha for work, but Kiri was too wrapped up in their problems, and Naruto's bloodlines would cause problems potentially on both sides. Iwa would sooner skin him alive despite that Tsuchikage not being a hard ass over what happened anymore since shit happened in war. Gumo would try to turn him into a breeding factory and have him expand their operations, and he had no intention of just siring kids and letting them be turned into village weapons. Suna, well friendly with Naruto, wasn't exactly getting a ton of jobs, and Naruto didn't care for the desert, and his girls wouldn't enjoy it much either. Thus, only Kanoha was left as a truly viable option for him, since he didn't have the experience and funding to make his own village, and no minor village would risk Kanoha turning their attention on them. So it was Kanoha or he wasn't getting a shinobi career. All of this meant he had to deal with the people he didn't want to deal with, but the bright side for him was that he could see his other precious people again. He could only imagine their faces when he showed them some of the secrets he had stashed away for when he needed trump cards. He also knew he'd enjoy the faces of Minato and Kashina's family when he returned and knew they'd be scrambling to apologize and make amends, yeah right. The best they could get would be him considering them friends. They burned that bridge for being family a long time ago, and it was worse still because Kashina and her children broke Uzumaki clan tenants and laws that breaking even just one of them was enough for the head to exile you from the clan, and breaking multiple ones usually ended up in your execution. He wouldn't kill them, but he sure as fuck wasn't letting them stay in the clan. He was the clan head now and it was his duty to ensure all members were true Uzumaki and followed all the laws to the letter. No excuses, ifs, ands, or buts. He shook those thoughts away as they neared the gate and prepared to check in, while he wondered just what the Hokage and his family were up to. Let's see for ourselves, shall we? Hokage Tower. Minato Namika's sighed as he sat in his office taking a break from the paperwork. He looked over the village feeling sad once again, since it had been six years since his eldest son had run away from the village. His teams that were sent to find him came back empty-handed, and he was limited to only fire country, since sending teams outside would be problematic, as not only would it possibly cause an international incident, but it could alert the other villages that his son was gone. That would have made Naruto a glaring target whether for assassins or recruiters. It had not gone over well. Tsunade had cut all contact with them along with Shizun and only ever spoke to them professionally. Sarada and Sasuke Chiha became colder towards his children and his wife. Mikoto became colder towards them all. Yugao and Atomi, who apparently his eldest was friends with, only ever spoke professionally to him, Jiraiya, or Kashina. Hiruzen had even stated how disappointed he was. Kashina and Kiwon had been inconsolable for over a month, refusing to leave their rooms and only eating when they absolutely had to. Arashi had just turned to training like a madman and had become a bit cocky because of it. Jiraiya had sent his spies and toads scouring for him, though he and Minato got their asses handed to them by the toads for treating the boy like that since there was no way they couldn't come clean. However, when nothing was found Jiraiya started being depressed and now rarely left Kanoha unless some word of Naruto came and then he took off to investigate. None of them ever panned out or got them any closer to finding Naruto. He turned back to his paperwork and to one document he had just finished filling out a short while ago. He had sent his wife's team consisting of her and Kakashi as the senseis, since Kashina had duties to attend to in council meetings at times, so Kakashi was there to continue teaching them and had Kiwon, Arashi, and Yakumo Kurama as their students. They were teamed with Atomi's team consisting of Sasuke, Sarada, and Sakura Hirano. Their mission was to escort a bridge builder named Tazuna to Wave Country and then possibly keep him alive as he finished the bridge connecting Wave to the mainland. He knew that Wave was in bigger trouble than the old man let on, mostly due to a ruthless businessman named Gato, but Minato was confident that with his wife and two Anbu level ninja, that there wouldn't be too many problems since Gato was a thug with more thugs, no highly trained warriors. However, he couldn't shake the feeling that there was going to be more trouble than he or they anticipated, but he had no one to spare to send as extra support just to be safe. It wasn't like he couldn't justify it, Wave while small was worth a country three times its size in economic value, with it being a major trade hub. Minato sighed not sure what to do as he contemplated things until he was forced out by his secretary getting his attention, Hokage-sama, there is a young man to see you. He doesn't have an appointment, but you're technically free for the next hour or so. She stated knowing he usually used this time for paperwork and review. Minato frowned and thought before deciding a break would be fine, it's alright, Maya, please send him in. 
Minato stated getting an affirmative before the door opened a minute later, making Minato freeze in shock. The man standing before him stood in a pair of black pants, black boots, a red muscle shirt, fingerless black gloves, a belt with some pouches, and a black cloak that seemed to almost be part of his body with how snug they were. On his waist was a scabbard with an oddly formed sword. However, it was his head that shocked Minato. Crystal blue eyes, three whisker marks on each cheek, sun-kissed blonde hair with red tips that was pulled back into a small ponytail, tan skin, regal-looking face, and little to no baby fat at all, and Naruto Minato stuttered out as the man in front of him looked at him with indifference. Hello Hokage-sama, it's been a while. Before you attempt it, do not hug me and treat me like nothing has happened before I left. I am here simply because there was no other real option for me to become a ninja, and no, I won't call you father. Naruto stated calmly and Minato flinched and looked saddened. But, this is your home, you belong here. Minato stated and Naruto merely looked at him as if asking is that seriously the best you got. I choose where I belong. I am only here because Kumo would try to turn me into a breeding machine, Iwa would probably try to skin me alive and then make me into a breeding machine, I don't care for the desert, so Suna is out. And I could have gone to Kiri to help them settle that civil war mess, but by the time I got there it would most likely be over, and there is the cost of going there in addition to actually getting there and getting the rebels to trust me. And if the rebels lost, then I'd have to fight the entire village to get away. I would have built my own village if I had the necessary land, experience, candidates and finances, but I lack the experience in leading large groups, as I've only led squads before and don't have the resources so that was out. And no minor village would take in the son of a cage, since it would draw a lot of attention, both beneficial and hostile, to them. Thus, I had little option left if I wanted to have a ninja career than to come to Konoha. It's as simple as that Hokage-sama and nothing more. Naruto stated calmly making Minato sigh sadly. I see. He stated not wanting to push matters right now, especially since it would just cause a bigger rift between him and his eldest. It didn't help matters that Naruto could just leave if he did push, since there wasn't anything to stop him. Minato couldn't arrest him or anything since he hadn't done anything wrong, he certainly wasn't going to have a Yamanaka wipe his mind or something horrible like that which some of the more zealous shinobi would suggest, and he definitely couldn't have someone following him constantly to keep tabs on him, especially if Naruto found out and things got violent. It was also a matter of Minato would need the rest of his family to talk and try to convince Naruto to stay, and he knew Kashina would kill him if he tried to convince Naruto and failed while she was gone. Basically, his only option right now was to suck it up and hope he could start mending the damage that was done. He broke from his inner musings as Naruto spoke, good, now well I'm sure you'd have a skills drill and exam to see what rank I should have, I am fine with genin rank. Anything higher than that would be seen as favoritism being shown, whether because I'm your son and you overbelieve in my skills, or because you gave me the rank just to make me more considerate to staying here and trying to make things right, as you no doubt would put it so I'll take Jen in rank, and I'm sure the Jonin senseis were assigned already, so I'll just be a floater helping out different teams and the like until such time as a team opens up, a new team can be formed, or I prove the point that I can be solo and be fine. Naruto stated since he wasn't going to have anything handed to him or let someone accuse him of getting something handed to him. Minato sighed slightly knowing he is right, it was why despite knowing his other two children were Chunin level, they still had to be Jenin. Minato could also tell his son had trained long and hard just based on his stance alone and the fact he kept looking where all the hidden amber were without even trying to find them. He'd like nothing more than to test him to see what he was capable of, but it would appear he didn't want to be anything higher than a genin, even if he was chunin level or higher, very well. He stated before digging in one of the lower drawers and pulling out a headband, since the hokage was required to keep some on hand in case they managed to get a missing nin to join the village or they got a defector. Naruto took the headband before undoing his ponytail and tied the headband around his head, pushing his bangs out of his eyes and letting his mop of blonde hair fall around his head just above his shoulders. The only reason he kept his hair this length was because his girls all had a thing for running their hands through it during makeout sessions, and his only issue with that was that it would get in his face at times and distract him. Now that he had a headband, he didn't have to worry about it as much, especially since he could turn it into a bandana if the headband wasn't as effective as he would like. Before either of them could say anything else, a Chunin rushed in with a scroll in hand, Hokage-sama. Urgent message from Kakashi. The Chunin stated as he quickly gave the scroll to Minato, who opened it and read the contents before cursing. Damn it. Naruto, I know you just got here, but you're all that I can spare at the moment for backup. Minato stated and Naruto shifted his stance to show he was being serious, I need you to head towards the land of waves and provide backup for team 6 and 7, they've encountered some extra resistance than we were anticipating and want backup just in case. Minato informed and Naruto nodded. 
all right, I'll take two companions of mine to help since there could be medical injuries and one of them is a skilled medic. Naruto stated and Minato nodded, though he wanted to question about his companions and dismissed him right before he disappeared from where he was standing, shocking the two people still there. Minato then shook his head and looked back at the Chunin, I want to be informed the moment any other available ninja arrive back in Konoha, no exceptions and no excuses. Inform the gate guards that all returning shinobi are to report to me immediately until further notice. He ordered and the Chunin nodded and left to deliver the orders. Minato sighed as he looked back at the scroll, the two teams had been met with an ambush of around 50 bandits, with the last one alive, telling them that Gato had apparently hired some extra muscle, in the form of missing men. One of whom was apparently Zabuza Mamachi, and if he had enough help, especially with bandits aiding then he could pose a threat. Minato believed in his children, student and wife, but they weren't invincible, and he wasn't taking a chance, and neither were they. He just hoped Naruto and his two companions would be enough to help them until he could find someone to send to help further. But Naruto. Said swordsman entered the hotel his girls were at while he went to see his ex-father and quickly told them the situation before having Anahana and Triss go with him while the others waited here. Once the two were ready, he and they took off with Triss using her unique bloodline to keep up with the two sword-wielding individuals. At their speed, it took them roughly an hour to reach the teams, and the sight was not one that inspired confidence. Kishina was trapped in a water prison, Kakashi was struggling against a trio of water clones, Itomi was facing five water clones, and two chunin ranked ninja called the Demon Brothers, and the Genin were facing more bandits and trying to keep Tazuna safe. They also noted how his former family members had changed. Kishina was still the same with her wearing Anbu-style gear without the sword, and it was customized into a vest instead of a chest plate, but he knew the vest was reinforced. The Kashi has aged a bit, but he could also see that Kakashi was slacking in his training, since he was an S-rank Anbu commander, and now he was struggling against an A-rank missing Min. Arashi had become nearly identical to Minato, counting the somewhat skinny build, only he had his mother's eyes and hair color instead of his father's. He was dressed in a blue long-sleeved shirt, black shorts, and the usual blue sandals with his headband tied around his left bicep. He also had a kunai holster on his left leg. He one was the opposite in that she was a near clone of her mother, but had her father's hair color and eyes. She was dressed in a red kimono top with a normal black vest over it, black tights, and blue sandals. Her headband was on her forehead while she had a kunai pouch on her right hip. Naruto then turned his attention to the two girls and saw one girl he recalled as Yukumo Kurama, which made his tenants snort a bit and recalled she was a Jinjutsu mistress in the making and assumed she was placed with Kishina and Kakashi because she needed to build up her abilities in other areas. She was pale-skinned, brown-haired, bronze-eyed, and wore a lighter pink battle kimono with a fishnet undershirt, fishnet leggings, and a pair of blue sandals. Her headband was dangling around her throat like a necklace. From what he could see, she had low to mid sea cup breasts, a perky ass, and slender legs. The other was a pink-haired girl that Naruto hadn't met but found she was a bit cute. Her pink hair was cut short and her headband was on her head almost like a bow, cream-skinned, emerald eyes, and small but kissable lips. She wore a red vest over a fishnet shirt, short pink skirt over a pair of black biker shorts, heeled boots that went to her knees, black gloves, two pink elbow sleeves, and two emerald stud earrings. Her right hip was also bandaged and had a holster over it, but it wasn't a kunai holster. Her figure wasn't as impressive as some others with her high below C cup breasts, slim waist, moderate hips, and then her best asset, which was her tight ass, that seemed to be jiggling slightly when she moved. Switching his attention to his friends and loved ones, he smiled seeing they had grown better since his time away. Sasuke has grown up well standing at 5'10 with his hair being in a small ponytail that hung by his shoulders, rather than it being up and looking like a duck's ass. He still had some baby fat to him, but he was lean and fit, showing he had been taking training seriously, but not so much that he bulked up and lost speed and control. His attire consisted of a white kimono top with the fish netting sewn in and an Ichiha fan on the back, black fingerless gloves connected to a pair of wrist guards, black pants with a pair of sashes dangling on the front that had the Ichiha symbol on them, and black open toed boots that went up to his knee. He also had an Okatana in hand ready to fight. Sarada had managed to balance out her natural cuteness with her new womanly body as she sported high sea low D cup breasts, a jiggly ass, slender legs, cream skin, reddish black eyes, cute face, and black silky hair that was pulled into a small braid that laid between her shoulder blades. Her attire consisted of a red battle dress with black booty shorts under it, black heeled calf boots, black fingerless gloves, a black choker with a red swirl on it, and her cute red rimmed glasses that helped push her hair out of her eyes. Her headband was around her right thigh while her kunai pouch was on her left. 
Atomi had become a gorgeous woman, and if it wasn't for the bit that she inherited her from her father, namely the teardrop marks and angular face, she could pass as Makoto's younger sister or even twin. Her black silky hair was braided into a ponytail that hung over her shoulder, while her face was both angelic and intimidating, due to the cold expression on her face as she was fighting. Her figure had filled out since Atomi now sported mid to high D-cup breasts, slim waist, tight stomach, wide hips, firm ass, and long legs with just enough muscle to accent her womanly curves. Her attire consisted of a black form-fitting bodysuit with a battle skirt over her ass and groin, a jonin vest over her chest, black fingerless gloves, and black high-heeled sandals. Naruto smirked at the last item since Mikoto was a bit infamous for being able to fight and do missions in those type of heels, and that they doubled as weapons since the heels were refined to a sharp tip. Of course that was also part of the trouble wearing them since if the wearer wasn't in full control and balanced the heel would stab into the ground or surface, making the wearer have to try and pry themselves free while making noise. Breaking from his musings, he quickly analyzed the situation before deciding on a course of action. Naruto had the two girls go aid the genin, while he quickly went through seals and launched a great breakthrough at the water clones and demon brothers, sending them back, causing all the fighting to stop as Naruto appeared before the clones. Naruto stood there with his hand resting lazily on the hilt of Orcrist as he stared at the eight clones and the two chunin, while everyone was staring at him in confusion and caution, I'm afraid I can't allow you to kill these Konohanin. Three of them are friends of mine, and the others recently became comrades, or I wouldn't have gotten in your way. Naruto stated coolly as he locked eyes with each opponent, making them take a step back unconsciously. Who are you? One of the clones asked and Naruto smirked before turning and pointing at the back of his cloak, making the clones widen their eyes and take a few steps back as well, W what the hell are you doing here, we're nowhere near samurai territory and I've never once crossed iron country. One of the clones shouted sounding intimidated, surprising both the demon brothers, the Konohanin, the originals Abusa, and the other person Naruto knew was off to the side watching the scene. I just told you, I just joined Konoha, so any fight with Konohanin is now a problem for me. Naruto stated turning back and now gripping Orcrist in its scabbarded, now, will you fold back or do I have to end your existence? Naruto asked before dodging and bisecting a bandit that came up behind him before resheathing his blade in a blink of an eye, well. I'm waiting. Naruto stated not bothered at all by the man he just killed, as he had quite a few kills to his name while serving Iron Country. The onlookers just gaped at the display since they couldn't even follow the movements he did to commit to the kill, and bandits were backing up, especially when two women appeared in front of the genin, with one holding a sword and the other having glowing hands, I suggest you leave or I will be forced to handle things my way. Naruto stated cracking his knuckles audibly making a few flinch before the demon brothers decided to attack using the chain that was connected to each other via the gauntlets they wore. Naruto merely watched them before he pulled a kunai out and waited till they got close. Once they did he threw the kunai into the chain with enough force to shove it down to the ground where it planted itself, forcing the two brothers to be yanked towards each other. However, before they could collide with each other, Naruto appeared and did a split kick to their heads, sending them snapping back and pulling the kunai free until Naruto kicked it back down into the ground and spun on it. The purpose of the spin was to deliver a roundhouse to one brother's head and swing him around into the other, forcing the two to the ground where he promptly jumped and landed on their arms that were connected by the chain. Naturally, the arms broke making the two brothers yell in pain before a swift kick to the head each knocked them out. Naruto then turned back to the clones and slowly approached them while dragging his sword out slowly, with the noise being deafening in the area. Once he was in front of the clones, they all gripped their swords tight before coming at him all at once making him snort in amusement. The first one came with a horizontal swing that Naruto jumped on and quickly beheaded the attacker before flipping and slicing another across the chest. As he landed, Naruto bent backwards to dodge another swing before he stabbed the attacker and then twisted his sword to do an arch swing that bisected another and spun on his right heel to bring his left foot up in a kick that caught another clone under the chin. Naruto then stepped back to let a cleaving chop land in front of him before he chopped the back of the clone's neck and stabbed behind him, impaling the last clone. The clones all dispersed leaving Naruto standing there looking at the real Zabuza with boredom evident in his eyes. Naruto then walked casually towards Abusa, who quickly released Kashina and jumped to the side with his sword at the ready. Naruto just walked across the water to Zabuza and stood in front of him with his sword out to the side, while the Konohanin were gawking both at his display and the two women quickly dispatching the bandits in effective measures. Kashina pulled herself out of the water and quickly moved back to the land since she didn't know who this guy was, but he was certainly better than many Anbu level shinobi. There was also the fact his sword and the man himself seemed familiar to her, but she couldn't quite place either of them. The Konohanin, minus Yakumo and Sakura, were feeling the same way about the person and couldn't figure out where they knew him from. 
They broke from their musings when Zabuza attacked only to have each attack blocked or evaded with ease, problem with a Zambato, you can only attack in four directions. Horizontal, vertical, and the two diagonals, which means your attacks are limited and I can easily dodge or counter them. Naruto stated since it was always an issue of Zanbados to have limited ability to attack, even if you could gain speed with it. Zabuza grit his teeth since usually his speed and skill with it was enough to make up for that fact, plus not many people had the strength to counter an attack from his sword, let alone shrug it off like it didn't bother them. He then continued his attack before Naruto disappeared, and Zabuza felt a blade as his neck making him freeze, you lose, but I know your ally in the trees won't let me kill you, so I'll let you leave with your two subordinates, and perhaps you'll be more of a challenge when you haven't used Charka to face someone beforehand. Naruto stated as he turned his blade so the side blocked the Senban heading for Zabuza's neck, before Naruto sheathed his sword and walked back to the shore. As he walked he idly saw a girl, the smell on her meant it wasn't a boy, land beside Zabuza and take him into a rectangular piece of ice, while the demon brothers fell into one that formed under them, before both pieces of ice disappeared. Naruto merely returned his attention to the group remaining and walked towards him, as Anahana and Triss scanned the different people for injuries, before standing beside Naruto, glad to see that you didn't get rusty after all these years, Itomi-chan, Sasuke team, Sarada-chan. Naruto stated with a smirk making the three Ichiha widen their eyes before Itomi and Sarada glomped him in a hug as Sasuke went over to him with a smirk. Naruto-kun. The two girls shouted as he chuckled and hugged them back, shocking the other Konohan in his key one, and Kashina had tears in their eyes while Larashi was looking at him analytically. Kakashi was merely gawking at him as Sakura and Yakuma looked confused. Naruto then pulled back and smiled at them, which caused them to blush, and it increased when they realized how well built he was, it's good to see you again, Itomi-chan, Sarada-chan, Sasuke team. He stated while Sasuke snorted and fist bumped him since Naruto didn't mean anything by the name, it was just what he had called Sasuke since they first met. Sasuke had decided he was stronger than Naruto, and Naruto had replied with, oh yeah. Well just try it team. Before they then beat the hell out of each other, with both winding up laying on the ground with grins on their faces at finding someone that could handle a fight with them. Naruto and Sasuke had been friends since and had always looked out for each other up until Naruto left. Now Sasuke could see that he clearly had a lot of catching up to do with his surrogate brother, though he was aware that his mother also had a thing for the blonde, but so long as he didn't have to see it, then he didn't have to worry too much, at least for now. He broke from his musings as Kashina walked up, Sachi. Kashina asked tentatively as Naruto then turned towards her with an expressionless face, causing her some hurt. Hello Kashina-san. He stated blankly making her tear up more at the fact he wouldn't call her mother. Naruto then turned his attention to Tazuna, Tazuna-san, we should get to your home before any more enemies come and before it gets late. He stated practically destroying the subject of his return, and Tazuna merely nodded before leading them to his home with Naruto and his group quickly following, and the others slowly coming up behind. It took an hour to reach Tazuna's home where he quickly entered and announced he was home and immediately got a hug from a young woman, father. You're back and alright. She shouted while hugging him and Tazuna laughed and hugged her back. Of course, I am Tsunami, it's thanks to these super strong ninja that were assigned, though a late arrival saved all of our butts. Tazuna stated as the Kanoha groups came in with Tsunami blushing slightly at seeing Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki miss. Naruto introduced himself not missing the hurt look on Kashina and Kiwan faces or the frown on Kakashi and Arashi's faces, I just recently joined Konoha after been training for a few years away from the village. Naruto stated kissing Tsunami's hand making her blush more before she allowed everyone in, my two companions are Triss Marigold and Retsu Anahana, two of my lovers. He stated making the two women blush with a smile while the other people were shocked at him. Do of. As in you have more than one and more than them. Tsunami asked shocked and Naruto nodded yes. Yes, each woman gained a piece of my heart and I a piece of theirs. I'm already engaged to marry one of them as it stands after having been around her for over five years. Naruto stated not at all ashamed or embarrassed to talk about his lovers, since there was just nothing to be ashamed about. Everyone merely gawked at him while Kashina felt her heart shattering, as not only did her son find someone, but was already getting married. It's true, and if it wasn't for Rukia-chan we wouldn't be with him either. Retsu stated with a smile while Triss nodded. Anyway, we'll have close to a week to get ready for when Zabuza comes back, and chances are Gato will be adding some more muscle, just to make sure we lose the fight. With that in mind, I can handle watching Tazuna during the day, while Triss-chan and Retsu-chan can look through the town and can help anyone with injuries. Naruto stated since it was the best course of action since the genin needed more training, and someone had to watch Tazuna while they did train. I don't think we have to divide ourselves like that, Naruto, one team can train, while the other watches Tazuna. 
Kakashi stated since it would give him and Kashina time to talk to Naruto, only to get a bored look from Naruto. Except we don't know how many extra hands Gato will hire this coming week, and doing your method would mean that the two teams each only got half the time to actually train, and that lowers the odds of survival, depending on what we're actually going to face. If they aren't ready then the more experienced of us here will have our attention divided between fighting and ensuring they don't get overwhelmed, which then puts us at risk along with them. So no, we will not do it that way. Naruto stated making them see his point as he went to his kitchen and took a scroll out before he began setting up the stove to cook. Tsunami was confused on what he was doing before she saw him reveal food from the scroll and start cooking and came over to help. She refused his comments on her not needing to help since she liked cooking and they were guests, which meant there was even more reason to help cook. Tris and Retsu were interacting with Itomi, Sarada, and Sasuke while attempting to be polite to Kashina, Kakashi, Kiwan, and Arashi. I say attempting because they weren't too happy with how the four treated their lover. While they had tried to help their lover get past his anger, they slowly saw his point of view as he revealed certain truths and idiocies they had followed for idiotic reasons. They did want Naruto to let go of his anger, and he had, but they weren't expecting him to forgive them for their various betrayals entirely, since not only was it against his nature to let such betrayals stand, it was also against his clan's core tenets and laws, both religious and not, and Naruto wasn't going to violate those no matter the intentions behind doing so. So, how long have you known Naruto? Kashina asked trying to be calm and polite, since the mother in her wanted to interrogate and learn everything about them and her son. Retsu merely looked at her a moment, oh, about five years now. Retsu stated casually since she hadn't actually met Naruto during his first year in Iron Country, so she wasn't lying. I see. Are either of you two the one he is engaged to? Kishina asked wondering if she could at least get to know her future daughter-in-law. No, that would be Rukia, who is in Konoha at the moment. I only entered a relationship with Naruto two or so years ago, while Triss has been with him close to three years. Retsu stated in the same polite tone. Why didn't you send him home? Kiwan finally demanded angry that these two women wouldn't send her brother home to his family. Retsu merely turned and stared at her impassively while Kishina, Itomi, Sasuke and Sarada all glared at her for being rude and where pray tell is his home, Miss Namikas. With people who ignored him for half a decade. With people who didn't even notice he was gone until an entire month after he left and said people weren't even the ones who noticed he was gone. Or maybe the home you are talking about is the village that despised him for holding that beast inside him, despite the fact you and your brother hold the chakra of that beast. By all means Miss Namikas do tell me which one you would like to choose. Retsu stated making Kiwan remain silent as to why we didn't, he risked his life and showed his character in reaching our capital city on his own, and it is he who chooses where his home is, not you, and certainly not the two people responsible for his birth. Retsu stated with an edge to her voice and clear venom present when she had said Namikas. I apologize for my daughter's outburst, it's just we have been worried about Naruto for a long time. Kishina stated giving Kiwan a look that said they would talk about this later. Then perhaps you should have been concerned about him from the start, instead of only when you noticed he wasn't there anymore. Triss stated coldly making Kishina flinch since she and the others did deserve that. That's enough Triss, Retsu, if they want any information concerning me then they can grow a spine and ask me themselves. Naruto stated from the kitchen having heard their conversation from there. As you wish, Naruto-kun. Retsu and Triss both stated as they returned to chatting about normal things with the Achehas of the group. It was a short time later that a young boy came in and merely looked at the gathered ninja and two others before scoffing and going upstairs to his room. A couple hours later had Naruto preparing the table which included a seal to expand it to hold the number of people as the food he and Tsunami were making was just about finished. Only Naruto's friends had been able to talk to him during that time as he wasn't feeling too conversational with his ex-family. The group ate quietly enjoying the food, while the boy from before was still sulking and glaring occasionally at the ninja, which was starting to irritate Arashi. However, there was no incident that night, and everyone turned in for the night with Naruto and his two girls sleeping in the living area, to ensure no one tried to sneak in on the bottom floor. Though Naruto did have to keep his girls a bit under control, since they only occasionally got some alone time with him when Naruto was able to do so, as well as make sure each girl got a turn with him and not a clone. Morning. The next morning had the Kanoha group waking up with food already on the table prepared and Tsunami sitting and eating, while Tazuna had already left for work with Naruto. Naturally a few were saddened by that since they wanted to talk with the blonde. However, Itomi, Kishina, and Kakashi knew they needed to get their teams into shape and began planning the schedules for training, since Naruto was taking over watching Tazuna. But said blonde, he was standing on a nearby rooftop overseeing the bridge construction, while an army of clones were helping Tazuna, after a bunch of spineless cowards quit out of fear, and now his clones were picking up the slack. 
evidenced by there being two clones carrying girders, others moving large cinder blocks, and still others setting the steel supports and rivets. Azuna was grateful for that since at the rate they were moving, they could be done ahead of schedule and be set, even if more workers quit. Plus the clones were technically extra security for him and the bridge, ensuring that none of Gato's thugs could get close without being seen and taken down. If he had this kind of muscle from the start, then he would have had the bridge done in a matter of weeks instead of months. On the other side of the village, Retsu and Triss were walking around casually looking over the area and marking anything of interest for Naruto, since he had an idea for Wave after they freed the country, and it would serve Naruto well in the future, and Kanoha, depending on how nice Naruto was feeling towards the village at any given time. The country would benefit as well so it was a win-win for both Naruto and the country, with Kanoha perhaps getting something from the deal too. It was also to serve as a backup option for Naruto, should things not work out with Kanoha, and Naruto wanted another place to stay besides going back to Iron Country. He loved the people there, but the snow and ice got annoying after a while. Not just the footing problem or the swords occasionally getting stuck in the sheaths from the frost, but as well as it sapping your strength and ability to move. There were benefits of course, burning fat to get muscle, chakra control exercises by using chakra to warm the body, learning to fight on unstable ground, and so on and so on. Essentially, the country and people were great, but the weather left much to be desired, despite the combat benefits provided. Anyway, Retsu and Triss were examining the different buildings that were boarded up or seemed to be on hard times and could close down at any moment. They knew Naruto's plans would benefit the country as much as it would Naruto, which is part of the reason they were all for helping him, since these people would need the help after Gato was eliminated. Even if they managed to take his fortune and use it to help the country, it would take years to rebuild everything back to an economic peak, which is where Naruto's plans would help expedite that and benefit him in more ways than one. This wasn't to say that Naruto only did something if it benefited him, but the combined benefits more than added a bit of incentive to give the help. So why not? They benefit and so does Naruto which lets them build a better relationship and help the country even faster. The two then broke from their musings and exploration at the sight of a group of thugs harassing a merchant demanding money. Naturally that didn't sit well with them, and they approached making the thugs look at them with sneers before they turned to perverted grins, well, well, what do we have here? A couple of gorgeous women out alone. Well we'll have to take care of them, won't we boys? Idiot thug number one stated making the other chuckle. Leave that man alone or we will be forced to resort to violence. Retsu stated making them frown before they saw her sword. Oh? What do you know boys, the lady thinks she actually knows how to use a sword. Idiot number two stated with a laugh making the others laugh too. Last chance before you die. Triss stated her fingers flickering with lightning, not that the fools noticed. The group then scowled, guess we're going to have to teach these bitches some manners boys. Number two stated as they drew their weapons before charging the two. However in a flash three were cut down by Retsu's sword, while the others were hit by lightning from Triss's fingers, making them scream in pain, as they were electrocuted and burned before dropping to the ground dead. Retsu sheathed her sword as Triss shook her hand slightly before turning to the merchant, who was busy thanking them, and Triss smiled before waving her hands, causing the ground to open and take the bodies of the thugs away. Triss and Retsu then continued walking around the area before they finally stopped at the town square and started helping the people who were either sick or injured, since both preferred being a healer to a fighter. They had originally focused on that and neglected their combat training until Naruto convinced them otherwise. His reasoning being that if they knew how to fight then they could protect themselves better as well as protecting possible patients and people who couldn't protect themselves. They had agreed with his arguments and had been keeping their combat and physical training up while also expanding further into the medical arts, which Naruto helped with via the Uzumaki clan scrolls. When a clan has as much chakra and has various effects depending on which part of the clan you took after, it had a wide variety on jutsu and applications. Like Ashina's being able to suppress a biju's chakra was one form of unique chakra the Uzumaki possessed. However, there were others that would be used to heal by pushing the chakra into a person. Where this would normally throw a person's chakra out of balance, this chakra would actually easily be absorbed by the target, letting them heal from life-threatening wounds in a matter of moments. There were others of course, but the only other big one was the type that Naruto was. A combat type. His chakra was potent, large, and brimming with power, this made him a juggernaut of energy, and it powered up his jutsu greatly. Where people could maybe put a tenth of their chakra into a jutsu to get it to activate, Naruto barely needed a thousandth, and it was stronger than the opposing jutsu. Naturally this only suited Naruto even better, especially as he got his control down to that of a cage. While his chakra chains couldn't suppress a biju, his were sturdier and stronger, meaning he could make a shield or weapon of them easily. So he couldn't suppress a biju, but he could still beat the shit out of it or restrain it with his chains. 
Anyway, Naruto had shared the knowledge of the medical arts with his girls that were interested in that area and helped them both learn the techniques and adapt them since his girls didn't have nearly the amount of chakra Naruto did. There were even medical techniques that were used for those that didn't have the healing chakra but still wanted to be a doctor or medic, which only further enhanced their skills. Now they were using said skills to help the people and build a rapport to both help them and Naruto in the future. Azuna's house. That night. The group was sitting and eating while the genin looked wiped and a bit roughed up. Naruto merely ignored it since if they had done serious training they'd look far worse, be passed out, or would have a bigger aura of accomplishment. So what's our training regimen for tomorrow? Sakura asked as she was a bit scraped up from the training and tired from using most of her chakra. We'll be doing tojutsu training tomorrow and then testing your elemental affinity since it's time you learned at least one jutsu outside of the academy and the couple jinjutsu that you know. Sarada and Sasuke will be focusing their control over the couple of jutsu they know since they still need refining. Itomi stated making the three nod. What difference does it make? You're all going to die anyway. Inari stated bitterly. Inari. Tsunami chastised since she couldn't believe he was being so cruel to the people risking their lives to help them. It's true. They have no chance of beating Gato. Inari stated before Rashi finally got pissed enough and slammed his hand on the table before standing and glaring at Inari. That's it. I'm tired of your mouth you ungrateful little owl. Arashi stated before he was forced to sit because of Naruto hitting him upside the head with his sheathed sword. That's enough Arashi-san. The boy is just venting his pent-up anger and sadness, it's obvious his father figure dying right in front of him made him emotionally wrecked. Naruto stated sipping the broth from some soup he and tsunami made before looking at Inari, tell me Inari, if it's so hopeless, why haven't you left wave country? Naruto asked making Inari open his mouth before he closed it not having an answer. It's because you don't want to insult your surrogate father's memory by running away, especially from the place he died fighting to protect. We are now risking our lives to protect your grandfather because he refuses to give up on the dream both he and your surrogate father shared in way of being free and prosperous. The mission was only to escort him back, not stay afterwards and protect him. We are doing this because we feel we should and want to help Wave, but we can't do that if we have to constantly worry about you getting in the way because you don't think we'll live to see this through. Naruto stated before he stood and patted Inari on his head, never be afraid to stand up for yourself. Naruto stated with a small smile before he headed towards the door. Where are you going? Sarada asked in confusion while smiling at how Naruto handled Inari. Just gonna get some fresh air for a bit, maybe practice with my sword. Won't be the first time I slept under the stars. Naruto stated with a smile as he headed out, and Inari merely left and went to his room with a contemplative look on his face. Ashina and Kiwon were tempted to follow him, but decided against it since they didn't want to push too hard after Kiwon's outburst to Retsu the day before. Naruto was a shinobi of Konoha, which meant they had plenty of time to see him. Next morning. Naruto was relaxing under a shady tree as he had spent the night practicing sword strokes and movements before deciding to stay outside that night since it was a nice night out. However, he also was alert since his senses picked up someone coming towards him and based on the scent he was smelling, it was the masked girl who helps Abusa. Deciding to wait and see what she would do, Naruto didn't react to her presence or worry much since his swords were sealed away and he was merely laying against his folded cloak without a care in the world. Aku had been in the area to gather medical herbs to ensure both Zabuza and the demon brothers were fully healed and recovered by the time the week ended. That plan was paused when she found the man that not only scared her father figure but also defeated him in a sword fight. If she could remove him, then the likelihood of success would be greater. Though she had to admit, he was handsome, and she almost wished that she could convince him to abandon Konoha and join Zabuza. If she were a darker Kanoichi, she'd be tempted to subdue him and keep him as her boy toy. She blushed as her mind wandered to things fit only for a certain orange book series and quickly shook those thoughts away as she moved towards him. As she got closer, she slowly reached for his throat only for a hand to grab her wrist as Naruto smirked before she was pulled down and pinned to the ground with Naruto over her. I usually don't mind a cute and beautiful girl waking me up in the morning, but you're the second to have tried to kill me in my sleep. He stated with a smile as he pinned her and Haku growled before using her weight to shift them so she was on top. I won't let you harm Zabuza-sama. Haku stated as her breath came out as a chilled mist. Naruto merely smirked as he shifted his weight causing them to roll on the ground still straddling onto the other till they stopped in the middle of the nearby flowers with Naruto on top. Haku struggled to get free but found herself pinned and blushing since not only was his face close to hers but a certain appendage of his was also pressed against her thigh and her breasts were against his chest, if I was a threat to Zabuza, I would have killed him during our first encounter. 
Naruto stated calmly as he looked into her chocolate brown eyes that held the same pain and loneliness that he would have had if he didn't have his friends. Aku stopped struggling a moment before glaring, I will not be a prize either. I'd sooner bite my tongue off than become some village's breeding machine. She shouted only for Naruto to pin her forcefully and glare at her a bit, but it wasn't in anger but disapproval. I have no intention of that either, though I do admit I would like you, Zabuza, and the Demon Brothers to join Konoha. Gato is a rad and a cheat, if he can get some job done for cheaper, then he will, which is why I believe he'll hire someone else for cheaper to kill Zabuza and the brothers, while taking you and any surviving women for himself. I will not lose the fight that comes in a week, but I hate to see potential wasted and destroyed before it can flourish. Thus, I am offering you a chance to speak to Zabuza about joining Kanoha, I will give my clan's protection over you and them to ensure there is no funny business. The Hokage is an associate and will back me up on letting you join the village. Naruto stated making her freeze slightly before looking at him in curiosity. It was also the first time she noticed his eyes, and she felt drawn to them as they seemed to draw her in further and further into their blue depths. She suddenly snapped back to reality as she realized she was about to kiss him. Blushing, she pulled back and looked away while Naruto merely chuckled, how how do I know you are telling the truth? She asked shakily since it would give them security and not worry about running anymore. Meet back here in three days with Zabuza, and I will have proof that you will have safe passage and protection with Konoha. Naruto stated as he stood and offered E this hand to help her up, which she took before nodding and leaving. Naruto then returned to the house and found the others had already headed out for training, while the clones he sent back earlier had left to accompany Tazuna. He then paused as a pair of clothed breasts pushed against his back, oh Naruto, me and Trischan need something from you. Retsu whispered into his ear before giving it a slow lick, making him hum slightly. Oh and what would that be? He asked with a smirk as he turned and saw Retsu in a black lace bra and thong that showed off her toned and fit body, the complimented her H cup breasts, doughy ass, wide hips, plump thighs, and strong legs. Oh I think you know. She purred as she pressed her tits against his chest and her hand going to massage his in his pants. I suppose I can help with that, but you'll have to show me where Triss is first, since I'm sure she's dying to get to me like you are. He stated huskily into her ear making her shiver before nearly teleporting them upstairs and taking him to the room she and Triss had decided to use for this purpose. Naruto exited the bathroom refreshed and satisfied with a sleeping tsunami in his arms, who also had a fuck stupid look on her face, and took her to her room and tucked her in before heading downstairs to keep watch and prepare lunch for the sleeping women. They'd need their energy after the sessions they had, and he already ensured to use some medical chakra to make it so Tsunami could walk properly. Yup, Naruto could honestly say it was a good day, and it was still getting started. Chapter 3. Bloody Waves. Wave Country. Tazuna's House. Naruto smiled as he set three plates of food on the table and put covers over them with a name for each woman on them, so they got the plate that was for them. He then sat down and pulled out a blank scroll and pen from a seal, before he wrote out a message to Minato, requesting permission to bring Zabuza, Haku, and their two comrades to Konoha to join the village, along with detailing why they'd be assets to the village. He also added in that they didn't need further reinforcements as it was handled right now. Once he finished the message, he stood and went outside before doing a quick summoning. When the puff of smoke cleared, standing in front of Naruto was a pure black crow with piercing amethyst eyes. Naruto smirked as the crow looked around before noticing him and quickly hopped on his shoulder and nuzzled against his face, Naruto-kun. The crow shouted happily in a clearly feminine voice as she nuzzled him. Naruto merely chuckled and stroked her feathers, earning him a hum of happiness, hey, Arella, I missed you too. Naruto stated with a soft smile as he pet the crow's feathers. He then twitched slightly as the now named Arella nipped his ear and glared at him, I know, I'm sorry I haven't summoned you in a bit, but I had to finish preparing to leave iron and everything. Don't be mad, you know I'd never purposefully forget about you. He stated as he stroked her feathers a bit more, and Arella stopped glaring before nuzzling his face again, hey, I need you to deliver this to the Hokage for me. He stated after a few minutes and Arella just looked at him, I know it seems a bit mundane to deliver this and bring me a reply, but since you're one of the normal size crows that can communicate easily, you can tell me what the Hokage and anyone say in the room without them knowing. Naruto explained and Arella smiled and nodded. Sure. No problem, I can do that. She stated happily always willing to help her personal summoner when it wasn't something humiliating or insulting, like him having her do a very mundane task. This felt like one until he explained the situation since she and the rest of her clan knew his story and history both from him and Atomi, and were more than just a little bit outraged at his so-called family. They had even contacted the Toads to demand answers for their new summoner's treatment, and the Toads were just as furious as they had just finished interrogating and punishing Minato and Jiraiya for doing such a thing. 
of course, that also led to the crows chastising the toads for telling Jurea about the prophecy the toad elder had apparently had. Mortals were not meant to know or meddle in the affairs of the gods, and Jurea had inadvertently done just that since Minato had apparently known about it too, which meant Jurea had blabbed when he was supposed to keep it to himself. So there was no telling how many people he may have told. It didn't matter if the ninja way of life was at stake, if the gods say it's gonna be destroyed, then there was not a fucking thing you could do about it. It only heightened their fury when they the toad said that the original prophecy was broken now, which meant Naruto was the child of prophecy, thus his life was further screwed up because of the toad's idiocy, and there was no telling what the gods wanted from him now. The toads had no defense as they had clearly overestimated their first summoner on keeping his big mouth shut about such things and shouldn't have told him about it to begin with. They also had to accept the fact that the crows wouldn't allow Naruto to be their summoner and would be looking for the Uzumaki clan summons to share their summoner with, which the toads understood, since they still didn't understand why Kishina hadn't even contacted the summons to sign her clan's contract. They'd see about Naruto's former siblings being their next summoners later on. Anyway, with them now watching over Naruto, the crows explained that every few generations the gods call on someone to perform a service for them, though it's never made clear what that service is until they do it. They also explained that it could be something people see as good or it could be something seen as bad, but regardless it was still that person's choice and no one else's, no matter what anyone else said. The crows then further went to state that so long as Naruto showed his loyalty to them and held true to their beliefs, then he'd always have their support and help. Naturally, Naruto had accepted that and was happy to find the crows' beliefs mingled and moved with his own and those of his clan. One big thing with them was that you never left a threat around to challenge you, if someone posed a threat to you, then you wiped them out. That wasn't to say that you did this needlessly, but you never allowed an enemy a chance to truly strike at you unless it was to trap and eliminate them. They prized cunning, deception, and using your talents to your every advantage to keep the edge over your opponent and never let them gain the edge over you. While not straight up fighters, they made up for it with trickery, jinjutsu, speed, and a few other things that only their clan were capable of doing, which suited Naruto just fine as he was embracing all aspects of combat both straight up and stealth, face to face and backstabbing, assassination and battle. The crows had helped in every way they could, teaching him various clan arts and styles, as well as helping him scout and finding out just which summoning clan was affiliated with the Yuzumaki. While Naruto wanted to stay with the crows, he also knew he had an obligation to ally with his clan's long-time summon allies, but made a promise not to neglect the crows. The crows accepted and began teaching them much of what they knew while he learned in Iron Country. While Naruto didn't perfectly match them like Atomi did, as she never preferred direct combat, instead using deception and skill most often, Naruto still proved a valued and respectable summoner, as he wanted to learn all ways of combat and dealing with threats, not just a direct method. It was six months into his training with them that he met Arella when he was summoning different crows to get to know and befriend them. Arella has been excited to be summoned since she apparently was the same age as him, and Atomi usually summoned the older ones, due to having known and worked with them for years, the younger birds usually didn't get called unless they got a new summoner. The two had hit it off well as they wanted to be the best, with no one being able to touch or surpass them, plus they both liked pranks and causing mischief to mess with people. It was only a couple months later that Naruto requested she be his personal summons, and the two had only grown closer over the years. Naruto then broke from his musings and handed the scroll to Arella, who took it and nuzzled his face again before taking off flying, while Naruto smirked watching her go. However, when he turned to leave, he paused before smiling, I'll be honest, I didn't expect you two to follow me. Naruto stated keeping his smile as he turned to look at two arrivals. One was a silver-haired weathered man with some scarring on his face, along with some scruff. He had piercing yellow eyes and padded leather armor with two broad swords on his back and a pair of hand crossbows at his side. He also had a silver chain with a wolf's head around his neck. This was Triss and Yennefer's brother Gerald. The other was a tall dark-skinned man with purplish hair and dreadlocks. He had a black kimono-style robe, white coat, purple sash, black forearm fingerless gloves with white bands, an orange scarf wrapped over his shoulder and torso, and he had a sword at his waist. The interesting thing was that he had a blacked-out visor over his eyes. This was Tosin, one of his instructors from Iron that served under Azen and taught him to fight blind alongside Edward and a couple others. Geralt smiled, yeah well, with you gone things quieted down a lot and you could use someone extra to watch your back. He then smirked, besides, if you intend to marry or court or whatever the term you and Rukia came up with with my sisters and daughter, then I'm going to make damn sure you don't slack off. Geralt stated and Naruto faked looking insulted. I'd never. Naruto stated before smiling and Geralt smirked. Naruto then turned to look at Tosin, and you Tosin. Naruto asked curiously, though he had a good idea on why he was here. 
I admire your determination to have justice for your clan and to expel traitors, I also know about the enemies you will incur because of who you are. You are quite possibly the strongest warrior in the countries, but you will still need help to face the enemies before you. I have decided to be one of those warriors. I shall aid you, Naruto-sama, until the day I die or fail to meet your expectations. Tosin stated before bowing to Naruto. Very well, when we return to Konoha and I get my seat as Uzumaki clan head, I'll induct you into my clan as a branch member to guard my family. Naruto stated and Tosin bowed in respect and acceptance. Good, Geralt if you so wish you can be inducted as well or wait until your sisters or daughter marry me and will become part of the clan that way. Naruto stated making Geralt nod as he'd have to consider when or if he wanted to join a clan, since it entailed a lot of things. Come on, I'll show you where we are staying for the moment until this absurdity that is this mission is over. Naruto stated as he led the two back to the house and then explained the situation to them in detail, leaving nothing out about what Naruto planned and intended. The two understood since, while a skilled swordsman, Zabuza hadn't truly dedicated himself to the art and tried to make up for it with his water jutsu and assassination arts. While he showed great potential given what he did to graduate from Kiri's academy, it was more for brutality and strength than finesse. Plus, contrary to popular belief, the seven swordsmen of the mist weren't that great of swordsmen, they made up for it with the powers and talents of their blades, thus people thought they were dangerous over the blades. All true in the case of Zabuza since his blade just couldn't permanently be destroyed, Kisum Hashigaki was the only full exception as his blade was dangerous and powerful, but the man was equal parts to it and could have been a greater swordsman if Samahada was designed to work like a true sword over Ascension Scaled War Club. The three then talked for a while and greeted the three sore yet satisfied women when they came down and ate the food Naruto prepared for them. Naturally, Triss was happy to see her brother, while Naruto introduced Tsunami to the two swordsmen, while informing her that they were no danger to her or her family. This also brought into the conversation that when the fighting at the bridge started, Naruto wanted them to hit Gato's mansion and kill any guards and thugs he had there before raiding the place. That way, while Naruto and the teams handled the bridge fight, someone could ensure Gato's remaining thugs were handled, since there was no way he'd let Zabuza fight and then pay him. Triss and Anahana would handle keeping the house, Tsunami, and Inari safe, since at worst it would be a couple thugs, which the two women could handle easily enough. However, he made it a point to Geralt and Tosin to behave around his former family members, as he didn't need a heated argument or a fight to break out outside of a spar, and even then he wanted them in control and not acting out, since both were protective of their allies. The two agreed of course as, while tempting to get a shot in at the idiots who deserted Naruto, it wasn't worth it when considering Naruto had his own plans to repay them and shove the mistake they had made into their faces. Say what you will for the discipline, restraint, and patience they had taught him, Naruto held all the vindictiveness, vengeance, and cruelness his clan was known for if someone betrayed or crossed them, all they did was make him less impulsive in his payback. No, now he could wait patiently for years at a time planning, outlining, preparing, and training for his revenge, and would account for every maneuver, rebuttal, attempt to stop, and anything else someone could do in response to what he would do. They'd taken the heir to the clan with a legendary thirst for vengeance, surpassed by none in the history of the world, and made him a disciplined, armed, trained, outfitted patient, tactical juggernaut of a man that could fight anyone he pleased with little difficulty, unless they were a high caliber of warrior or ninja. Thus far, Lord Mifune, Zaraki Kenpachi, Aizen, Kenshin Himura, and Anakin Skywalker were the only ones capable of facing him for extended periods of time and not lose. To sum it all up. Don't fuck with Naruto unless you wanted to lose and lose badly. A lot of people would learn that soon, and those that wouldn't would suffer the consequences. Next day. Naruto was outside the house with Sasuke and helping him with a chakra exercise, as it involved coating a weapon and chark it to a fine sharpened edge. It was Chunin level because it was hard to fully and evenly coat the weapon, and the difficulty went up the longer the weapon was, or if you used elemental chakra. Naruto was doing normal chakra right now, mainly because it was a foundation exercise for coating weapons in elemental chakra, but had the added benefit of helping in controlling chakra better, as well as teaching you how to flow it and control the flow. Controlling it helped when you used jutsu that involved coating your hand, body, or whatever in the jutsu or just your chakra. However, experimenting with your body could be hazardous, since you could overload your chakra points, damage cells, or unintentionally use elemental chakra, which would harm you even worse than normal chakra, since you'd be putting lightning, fire, etc etc. For your body and losing control or not having enough control could destroy nerves, set you on fire, sweat blood, or a host of other things that no one wanted to experience. 
off to the side, Anahana was helping Sakura with some medical jutsu as the girl had asked her what she specialized in besides a sword, and Anahana had revealed she was skilled in medical jutsu and other healing techniques, which was something Sakura had an interest in, so Anahana took her under her wing to start learning. Anahana was wondering if she'd prove skilled in the art or if she was just a jinjutsu mistress. Naruto believed she may since Atomi seemed to believe she was capable of achieving great things or she wouldn't have taken her as a student. Her control was good, but that was partly because her reserves were so small, but if she could maintain that control, then she'd be a perfect jinjutsu mistress and medic nin, maybe even a baddest bitch like Anko was supposed to be. Regardless, it would be hinging on how well Sakura took to medical jutsu and if Anahana and Triss thought she could handle it all. Her skills could be expanded on later if needed, he was just glad she wasn't some obsessed fangirl that would sooner diet herself to death than take training seriously. Atomi had to tell him she was nearly that way before Sakura's mother, a former high chun and low jonin level Kinoichi, beat some sense into her, literally. Once she had Sakura's attention, she then sat her down and talked to her about different things concerning being a Kinoichi and the fact that she shouldn't focus on a boy so much that she fails in her training. If she did, there was the chance she'd be killed or raped and enslaved, and Sakura wouldn't have the skills to get away. She also told her that while liking a boy was fine, don't make them the center of your universe as it can blind you to other things that can make you happy if the boy isn't interested. Since then, Sakura had been working hard and, while being friendly to Sasuke and Arashi, hadn't been focusing on getting a date or anything and was feeding and training her body like she should be. Of course, unknown to Naruto, she was also training under Anahana to get information on Naruto, since her mother was friends and teammates with Makoto and Kishina. Mabuki had told Sakura that Naruto was probably an ideal person for her to marry, but she had written it off because she never met or even knew Naruto, much to Mabuki's ire, as she wanted Sakura to bond with her friend's children. When Mabuki found out Naruto had left, she was pissed like the others that cared since she had met him couple times and wished she had invited him to dinner to see how things were for him. She was filled in by Makoto, and she was understandably pissed at Kishina for doing that to her own son, which was when she started noticing she overlooked Sakura's fangirl ways and began breaking her from that. She also told her to talk to Naruto if she ever met him as he needed friends and those he could rely on if his own family was going to treat him like that. Now, some lesser people would think it was just to get to the Uzumaki clan's funds or get in with the Hokage's family. Well, they'd be dead wrong. Ibuki had wealth and status by being part of the civilian council and having successful businesses. The council was a surprising thing, since no one had expected Minato to create one. The reason he did was because after the Kayubi incident, he had to focus on village defense and ensuring no enemies smelled blood in the water to the point they'd attack. So well he handled the military, the civilian council, under the watchful eye of Harrison to ensure no greedy or ambitious individuals tried anything, were handling the economic affairs with Harrison, bringing any possible fruitful proposals to Minato to look over with Kishina to approve. But it worked so well for the first five years that Minato kept it going to see if it could be a permanent group, of course him having less paperwork as a result had nothing to do with it. Anyway, with Harrison watching over the civilian council, there were no problems that could be classified as major one. The only real noteworthy issue was when a big shot businessman from outside Kanoha trying to muscle his way in and take a place at the council, only to get thrown back out on his ass while his donations to people in the village were still used without any influence being gained. The fool tried to threaten and use political and monetary connections, only to find it useless against the Hyuga and Saratobi connections and the different funds the merchant guild and clans could use to back up the village. It didn't hurt that many of the clans had side businesses and connections to ensure if he tried to cut off another civilian supply, then they could pick up the slack and help. What quite a few didn't know was that some of these contingencies and plans and protections were made by Naruto through meetings with Hiruzen, since the two saw each other when Naruto was still in the village. Hiruzen had mentioned the heavy dependency their different shop owners had on outside suppliers, and Naruto suggested looking to the clans and their own supplies of things. The Aburum had silk, honey, and dyes and their own orchards and vineyards using the insects to keep the plants going with their care. The Yamanaka had countless gardens growing various herbs and plants. The Akamichi had spices, alcohol, barley, wheat, and the necessities to make really any kind of food you could want. The Nara had a plethora of meat, bones, antlers, and pelts from them using the carcass of any of their deer that died, as well as a library of medical knowledge from working with the Akamichi and Yamanaka. The Inuzuka had fertilizer, pelts, lures, scents, and remedies for both animal and human. The Ichiha had the largest vegetable farm by far due to their bloodline of loving tomatoes, as much as Inuzumaki loved Draymond. The Saratobi kept a pristine orchard and vegetable farm, as their clan were more veggie and fruit eaters than carnivores. 
The Hyuga clan had a large vineyard, rice farm, various connections to just about everything, and money to back it up. Naruto had pointed out that Hiruzen and his son Asuma himself bought their tobacco straight from the Yamanaka, and it was better quality than most suppliers. While the village wasn't entirely self-sufficient they could cut costs by having the clans work with the village and retailers to help cut out outside influence besides the fire daimyo's own. Hiruzen had taken the ideas and ran with them having personal talks with each clan head and working out fair deals for everyone with the Hyuga also taking roles as investors to get businesses the money to expand or build up. The village ended up saving a lot of money and not purchasing from outside suppliers and bought it little as needed unless they got a really good deal out of them. Naruto had kept in touch with Hiruzen and the others through letters and kept offering advice to Hiruzen if he asked for it. When they first discussed the clans, Naruto would have mentioned the Yuzumaki being another good helper. However that would have required Kashina to have ever bothered to fully visit and clean up their ancestral homeland. It was filled with metals, minerals, jewels, and fish. Not to mention the wealth in the Yuzumaki clan accounts that were held by their trusted friend the Fire Daimyo. Kishina has let the former go to waste and as a result disrespected their clansmen and the dead by leaving all the corpses there to rot and wither away for decades. Naruto though wasn't going to do that which was why he had already brokered a deal with some contacts to begin mining in Yuzu again, so long as a few rules were followed to the very letter. 1. The graves he made were to be untouched, regardless of how much wealth was under their burial ground. 2. The land was to be mined but not destroyed, they could mine it, but if the land was ruined because of it, then he was coming for whoever did it. 3. None of the buildings still intact were to be destroyed, and the ones that were broken beyond repair were to still have their foundation kept intact. 4. There was to be no bloodshed on his ancestral home unless it was in self-defense or they were punishing someone for a crime they committed there. So long as those rules were followed then Naruto and they would keep a good business relationship, and Naruto made a point to be clear that he would know if any rules were violated. Violating those rules meant Naruto would kick them out and kill everyone he had to in order to do so. Luckily, some friends and allies were watching over the mining operations, so they'd keep things from getting too out of hand and ensure his rules were followed. Back to the point though. Mabuki didn't need the wealth or status that would come if Sakura and Naruto married down the line. She genuinely thought Sakura and Naruto would make a good couple. At the here and now, again, Triss was also helping Sarada with her control and her lightning affinity, since it was the main form of aggressive combat Triss excelled at. Yennefer excelled in fire and was more aggressive than her sister, thus she excelled at combat, but Triss was better at the healing arts. Sarada was also going to learn at least some of the healing arts, since it would be useful to have the skill. Even if she couldn't do anything major, being able to help heal someone would be useful and could help in an emergency. You couldn't have enough medics in one group, but the key was to ensure the medics at least knew how to fight and protect themselves, and possibly had some protectors or support, since medics were usually targeted first in a fight. Meanwhile, Itomi was practicing her swordplay against Tosin to help her get better and get some of the rust off her skills. She realized while fighting Zabuza and his group that she'd let her skills with a blade slack, which was partly because there were only four people worth training against with a blade, or rather, there were four. Ashina has grown too accustomed to being a housewife and let her skills slack and only just started regaining them when she decided to get into shape to train her children, but neither used a blade, so her skills were still severely degraded after so long without using them. As for the other three, they were busy with their own duties, and Itomi could only see them so much. Yugao Yuzuki was her primary training partner when they were both in Anbu, but since Itomi left it about three years ago to help her clan and become the Jonin sensei to her siblings when they graduated they couldn't train together as easily. Yugao was still an Anbu captain, thus her schedule and duties kept her from having a lot of relaxing time or chance to train with Itomi. The other two, Hayate and Raido, were skilled with a blade, but Raido was an elite bodyguard for the Hokage, and Hayate had a sickness that limited how long he could train or fight before it became dangerous. Thus, both weren't exactly active sparring partners, and the few times they could train it wasn't an intense fight that pushed her skills. However, Tosin had no such limitations or reservations, and as such was making her fight like she was doing so for her life. Tosin and the others in iron didn't pull any punches. If you wanted to learn then you had better be ready for bruises, broken bones, cuts, gashes, lacerations, and really anything and everything that was a wound from fighting with swords and limbs. Itomi was fine with that and was told to not use her Sharingan or any Jutsu strictly blades, which she was also fine with, as she could train her eyes and Jutsu any time, but swordplay was something you really needed an opponent to face to grow in skill. The fact that Tosin was blind and such a skilled fighter only made her more intrigued and interested to learn, since her own eyes were at risk of the same fate if she overused her Sharingan or she was hit with a rare disease that was genetic in her clan. 
Gerald was back at the house keeping an eye on things while Litomi's team was training and Kashina and Kakashi's team were guarding Tazuna. Tomorrow Kashina's group would be here training and Itomi's team would be guarding Tazuna while Naruto and his group were going to help the village out a bit. A day after would be Naruto's group protecting Tazuna while both teams trained, though Naruto would have a clone with Tazuna as he needed to see Haku and Zabuza since the paperwork and agreement came late last night. It was also last night that Naruto had to contain his laughter at Kashina's group, trying to be subtle in their questioning of Geralt and Tosin to get information on them and Naruto in general. They failed miserably besides Naruto stating they were two friends and teachers of his that wanted a change of scenery and maybe see if the local talent were worth training or not. Naturally the point of needing clearance came up and Naruto circumvented that via stating he had already sent a message to the Hokage about the matter, which Naruto did this morning with Arella being sent out again. She didn't mind the job since it let her get a lot of fresh air and new scenery while helping her friend and summoner. A deception was needed because he didn't need Kashina or her two children or Kakashi hounding him about his decision and him being the Uzumaki clan head, let alone him planning to exile them from the clan due to them being blood traitors as the Uzumaki called them. The term blood traitor was reserved for anyone who broke the laws and tenets of the Uzumaki clan to such a degree they couldn't truly be Uzumaki and they therefore betrayed their blood and kin, thus they were blood traitors. Of course, once he took the clan head seat, there was nothing they could do about his plans and decisions, as Kashina would further insult and desecrate the Uzumaki core values if she tried to resist him taking the clan head spot or tried to fight his decision and plan. Her children would probably but that only reflected further on Kashina as she should have instilled the core values and tenets of the clan into her children if they were to ever be considered for taking the clan head spot in Kanoha's council chambers. Naruto had an entire list of things to just pound home that Kashina was not, is not, and could not be the Uzumaki clan head. Even just cutting away the fact she left Yuzu in such a state, she also abandoned the Uzumaki shrine at Kanoha and allowed it to go into disrepair and disrespect the Shinigami. A deity that the Uzumaki clan primarily prayed to and honored hence the shrine and temple being dedicated to the death god and held one of the treasures that the Shinigami granted the clan within it. Such a thing was inexcusable, and Mito would be kicking her Aunt Tsunade's ass all over the village for daring to let it happen. Only difference was that Tsunade was raised as a senju, so she wasn't fully accustomed to Uzumaki ways, and Tsunade wasn't trying to claim to be clan head of the Uzumaki. Kishina should have taken the Uzumaki seat to get things done for the Uzumaki clan, but never claim she was the Uzumaki clan head or that she could dictate which of her children would be the next clan head. The Uzumaki did not allow or believe in inheriting seats or positions. It was picked based on skill, experience, and capability for the seat, not because your father or mother held it and decided to pass it on to you. Such a thing was not in the best interest of the people as a whole, as you could be great at fighting but suck at politics, which meant you wouldn't fit as a leader having to deal with allied leaders and enemies. You could be great at politics but suck at handling money. There were just too many cons to the whole inheriting a position for it to be worth it. Chief among them being the inheritor could be cold, selfish, pompous, and ruthless, thus the Uzumaki did it, so you had to be chosen by items that were sacred to the clan, and all members accepted it. The ink cage was the only thing that was popular vote to achieve, and even then, it was from a narrowed list of approved candidates. Clan head, Jonin commander, Anbu commander, advisors, and other positions within the clan were granted by other means. Clan head was already discussed, but the others had to be picked by the clan head and at least one of the items connected to the clan. Same with the cage as the items would react to who was worthy to be cage, and if there was more than one candidate, then it was done by popular vote. Many had considered their ways foolish, but not once did the Uzumaki have an irresponsible or incapable ruler or person of authority in their history. When countries or villages degraded because of their terrible rulers, Whirlpool and the Uzumaki only thrived and grew stronger. Of course, it was that strength that made them a threat and justifiably so since one clan wiped out multiple minor villages and severely weakened the major ones that attacked them during the second war. Part of their strength came from taking in refugees from all the different countries, getting people of all kind of trades and even some with bloodlines, and quite a few were brought into the clan as branch members or even main members if they married in. The branch house of the clan were the protectors of Yuzu and the main house, while the main house were the ones who took authority in missions outside the county, but no one was forced into it and the main house treated them as brothers and sisters while training them to be stronger and better fighters. The branch house was almost as feared as the main house, given the diverse and brutal methods implored to protect the country. They had ex-MRI, Ronin, exiled ninja, weapon masters, former master of arms for daimyos, and many others that all knew how to fight and kill when necessary. 
Now though, only Naruto and maybe a small handful somewhere in the world were all that was left of the main house, and he'd have to work on rebuilding it with his lovers, while Tosin and maybe Geralt and Zabuza would be his first branch members. A good start admittedly, but still a long way to go before it would be back to a respectable sized clan. For now, Naruto would keep a clan in Konoha, but eventually he would move it either to Yuzu to rebuild or maybe even here to Wave, since it was peaceful and had no protection from bandits and the like. Right now, he was going to help Sasu can then meet with Zabuza and Haku when the time came. Two days later. Naruto stood in a clearing petting Arella as she sat on his shoulder and nuzzled his face. He knew Zabuza, Haku, and the demon brothers were there watching him, no doubt seeing if there was an ambush or anything there that could cause them problems. He couldn't blame them, an enemy combatant invites you to a private meeting where he allegedly will be providing documents to offer amnesty in a village for seemingly no reason. It did seem a little too good to be true and smelled a lot like a trap. However, Naruto was fine with it and just Petarella as he stood there waiting for one of them to decide to show themselves. Tosin and Geralt wanted to go with him, but he decided against it or it would put them on even more of an edge. Plus, someone had to be there to watch over Tizuna. Arella brought the reply back to him, and sure enough it was positive, and Arella had no mentions about any discussion she overheard other than Minato, saying he'd update Anbu and Joan in patrols to ensure they kept an eye out for anyone from Kiri concerning Zabuza's group. Thosin and Geralt were accepted easily enough, but it was mainly because Minato knew having another two sword experts in the village would help it, and maybe he could get some extra info on his son while added. You can come out whenever you want guys. Naruto stated as he looked towards the trees they were hiding in causing them to come down. Naruto merely glanced at the four as he kept stroking Arella's feathers. Aku informs me that you can get us situated in Konoha. Zabuza stated while keeping his blade ready. Naruto merely nodded before unsealing a small folder and tossed it to Zabuza, who caught and opened it to show four citizen registration papers, passports to get into Konoha, and registration papers to be ninja of Konoha if they so desired. Zabuza looked them over with an extremely critical eye to ensure this wasn't some ploy to capture them upon arriving at the village, last thing he wanted was for him to be dead, and Haku turned into a breeding factory for Konoha. Though, given the rumors of the fourth Hokage and his wife, that latter item was an unlikely scenario. But still, better safe than sorry. After a careful examination, Zabuza found no signs of them being anything other than legit, so what exactly is the deal with this if we accept? Zabuza asked as he looked back to Naruto. You sign the documents, present yourselves to the Hokage, and then we go from there with a probation period, a test to ascertain the rank that you should have, and then housing within an apartment. Though there is an alternative should you wish it. Naruto stated as he kept petting Arella. Sounds interesting, but what about Haku? I have no intention of letting anyone turn her into a breeding factory for bloodline children. Zabuza stated while Haku looked a little worried. That would be part of the alternative living arrangements. I will be taking the clan head seat of the Uzumaki clan within Konoha, so I can provide clan protection, and I am close to the Ichiha clan head, so she will back up my claim. The living arrangements come in the form of you being able to stay in the clan compound I will build after this, as Konoha has all but forgotten the Uzumaki. Naruto stated making them look at him in surprise. I thought the fourth Hokage's wife was the Uzumaki clan head. Maizu asked in confusion and Naruto nodded. That is a common misconception on account of the fact she and others of the Kanoha ruling body decided she was clan head. However, she didn't earn the title as she was supposed to according to Uzumaki clan law, thus she will be removed from that position the minute I can get a council meeting to take place, which will be near immediately due to the situation I'm part of. Naruto stated confusing them a bit. Situation. Haku asked curiously and Naruto sighed a bit. Ashina Uzumaki and Minato Namikas are my birth parents. Naruto stated though it was with some disdain for the two people he named. Naturally, that declaration shocked the four, eh, so you're the boy that rumors said fled Konoha. Gozu stated since there were rumors of one of the fourth's children having left Konoha, but nothing was confirmed. Yeah, they weren't the best of parents towards me and instead favored my siblings. So with the help of a dear friend of mine, I went to Iron Country and trained under the various masters and experts there, which began my reputation. Naruto stated with a sigh, then I went to Yuzu and proved my worth a clan way to become clan head and took the treasures of my clan with me after burying the dead. Now, I'm starting my ninja career in Konoha because it's honestly the best option for me, given how some of the other villages would react to me or the issues that two of them have that I don't wish to accommodate. Naruto explained making them frown wondering what the hell parents could do that a kid would decide to risk his life to get away and get stronger. And what exactly would us coming under your protection entail? Zabuza asked wanting to fully know what he was possibly getting into before he agreed to anything. So long as my clan exists, you'd be protected by it so long as you don't break the law. 
to go into further detail, I actually want you, Zabuza, to join my clan as a branch house member. Naruto stated making them look at him in surprise again. What the hell does that entail? Maizu asked since he couldn't fault a young man for wanting Zabuza and a clan given his talents, but how do you just take someone into a clan like that? The Yuzumaki always had a policy of taking in people who needed a home and a family, those that showed talent as warriors were asked to join the branch house if no one in the main house had an interest in them. Essentially, the main house was all the blooded Yuzumaki, while the branch house was all the adopted Yuzumaki. The branch house were the guardians of Yuzu and were essentially the primary police and protectors from invasion and visitors, while the main house ran the village and took most of the missions outside of the country. The branch house was happy to do it as the Yuzumaki had taken them in when they were on the run and had no purpose, so they were glad to defend their home and get to have a family. Naruto stated making them nod while impressed, since such a thing as adopting others into a clan was unheard of outside of the rare clan head taking in an orphan or two. Also, don't get me wrong, I'd have no problem if Maizu, Gozu, and Haku were to join the branch house too, I was just more interested in having one of the Swordsmen of the Mist as my now third branch member. Naruto stated wanting to be clear he wasn't insulting Gozu, Maizu, or Haku with his offer specifically to Zabuza. The quartet nodded while Zabuza frowned, you've put me in quite the predicament, I am still under contract with Gato. Zabuza stated and Naruto merely raised an eyebrow. You don't honestly think I believe that you trust him to uphold his deal do you? He only pays what he absolutely has to pay, he can just hire a small army of bandits, a small squad of missing nin, or both for less than half what he's paying you to kill you and anyone else after the fight at the bridge in a few days. He'd assume we are weakened from fighting and can wipe us all out easily, though I'm sure he'd order his men to not kill the women, as he can use them for other purposes. Naruto stated with a frown at the end, since he knew what a full-blooded Yuzumaki, an ice user, and two prime and ready-to-breed Sharingan users could fetch for the tub of lard if he sold them to a few different places. Kashina would just have it worse since, while well, Kiwon was valuable as Minato's daughter, Kashina was a 100% Yuzumaki woman in her prime and ready for breeding, and Iwa would no doubt pay a lot for the chance to breed the fourth Hokage's wife and daughter. Zabuza frowned since Naruto had a point in what the midget would likely do to save money. The full thought money was the most valuable thing in the world and was the only real way to show and hold power. Ha. Huh. If that were true daimyos wouldn't need armies to defend their land since they had such vast treasuries of money. Alright, you got a point there, but I still don't know about this. Zabuza stated and Naruto smirked. You mean essentially swearing a loyalty to a person around half your age. Naruto stated still smirking while Zabuza snorted and nodded. Yeah, that does sting a bit, but I do have to admit you have skill with your blade and you've got a reputation I can respect. Zabuza stated since the Sage of Swords had become a bit of a bougieman for anyone that would consider threatening Iron Country, since there were numerous reports of him bringing down bandit hordes alone and taking out some of the other bougieman swordsmen that had turned. Rogue and left Iron Country. Some of those rogues counted a couple men even Kissam would be cautious about, and that guy was almost a literal monster in combat. Then how about a fight? On the day that you'll be back at max strength, you and I can have a straight up fight without anyone interfering, and if you lose, you'll agree to join the branch house. If you win, I'll give you as much money as you can possibly carry. Regardless of the outcome though, you can still join Konoha and have my clan protection over you. Naruto stated making Zabuza frown in thought since at first glance it was an easy win, but Zabuza could see his stance and his way of doing things that he was no amateur and was more seasoned than some people twice his age. Zabuza could live with having fealty to someone like that, especially if he got to put up a fight first. All right, you got a deal kid. Zabuza stated before gripping Naruto's arm, and Naruto reciprocated it as they shook. See you in a couple days. Zabuza stated before he and the others left and Naruto smirked. Seems you've got four more allies, Naruto-kun. Arella stated as she knew her summoner was building up his own power base to get the upper hand over others. Yup, and with the girls getting some of the ground work done in Konoha, I'll have an even larger base to work with soon. Naruto stated with a smirk as he scratched under her chin. By the way, have you summoned the others recently? Arella asked and Naruto frowned slightly. Yes, just to check on things since they asked that I wait until after I take the clan head seat before discussing full privileges with them. Naruto stated making Arella cock her head. Why so long? Arella asked curiously. Well, the clan they were allies with for over 200 years was destroyed down to a small few, and the last known adult didn't even bother to try and summon them and tell them what happened. They had to hear from you and the toads before I managed to find the contract. Right now they are mourning their friends and surrogate family, as well as nursing the sting of the betrayal they feel Kishina has committed towards them, as they were bonded to the Yuzumaki clan more than the Inuzuka are to their ninja hounds. 
I can understand that they'd want some time to mourn and vent before discussing having a chief summoner again. Naruto stated knowing the Uzumaki clan summons were deeply hurt and wounded to know that so many of their friends had been killed and they were never notified about it. Contrary to popular belief, names weren't removed from a contract when the holder of the name died. Their connection to the contract was just cut, which was due to no one wanting dead members to be used to summon if they were brought back by a jutsu. Ido Tensei was one example. Naruto broke from his thoughts as Arella spoke again, that makes sense. It'd be like if you and Atomi were killed and someone decided to wait decades to tell us. We wouldn't want to focus on getting a summoner until we finished grieving, as we wouldn't be able to put all of our heart into being allies till we were done accepting the loss. Arella stated making Naruto nod before he stroked her feathers again. Don't worry, I'm not going to forget you or the others, I swore on my blood and clan. The others will understand when I explain it to them. Naruto stated making Arella smile and nod before she nuzzled his face again. Naruto smiled before he started walking to the bridge to replace his clone and discuss some things with his surrogate family. Maybe even add a few hundred clones to expedite the construction of the bridge. End of the week. Naruto sighed as he awoke finding a naked and smiling Tsunami sleeping on his chest after the night of fun they had since Tsunami wanted to keep having some fun and relief and forget the troubles of Wave for now. She also did it as a way to show her gratitude for what he was doing around Wave, despite his attempts to dissuade such a thing. Yesterday he had used some of the money he had accumulated to buy a few of the struggling businesses for twice what they were worth, before then explaining to the owner turned manager what he wanted done and how he wanted things to work. For what he was paying and for helping Wave against Gato, they gladly agreed and began working on spreading the word to a few others about the opportunities. Of course that also led to speaking to Tazuna and Tsunami in private about his ideas and plans for Wave. Naruto wanted to essentially turn Wave into the hub of his information network. This would work via their tourist and rest areas, keeping track of any information worth noting while their traders and fishermen did the same thing. By essentially having the country as a spy network, Naruto could get information from all over, and no one would even suspect what was happening, since drunks tended to talk and blab without thinking, and traders heard things because people tended to not pay attention to them. Plus his expansions would help them get more goods and trading, and more tourists, since Wave was essentially an island that could be a resort and cater to expensive and lower class people. Fresh fish, fresh fruit, boat rides and tours, beaches everywhere, diving areas, and a host of other relaxation activities and things to sell provide to people. Add in some casinos, a few more bars, some hotels, a brothel or two, and some other things, and people would be coming here even more. Azuna and Tsunami has been surprised at his suggestions, but saw they did have merit, since many avoided their country because they were so small and had nothing really to offer besides some beaches. Plus you had to find a boat coming to them because they weren't a big shipping area, though Gato added that, but his business ethics left much to be desired. Hence why Naruto could acquire the shipping business and then either have Tazuna or someone else run it or turn it over to Tazuna to do with what he pleased. Either worked for Naruto as another information pathway would be opened, as well as a supply line for harder to find items and supplies. Anyway, Naruto had given them time to think on it, and Tsunami had taken him to her room, and the night was spent pleasuring the other, since Anahana and Triss were helping the villagers too late and wanted him to have fun befitting a young lord and man of his status, as they had put it at times. Essentially, the girls and Rukia decided that before he sealed the deal and got married, he should have fun and enjoy his life as much as he pleased, despite his arguments against their insinuation that he'd not be happy or have fun when he did marry them. Rukia, at the very least, didn't care and wanted her love to enjoy to his heart's content before they married, and even stated she'd encourage it afterwards, since there would come a time possibly where she and the others would be pregnant and he'd have to find relief elsewhere. Never mind the argument that they could just be carefuler he had over a dozen lovers, and that's not counting any women in Kanoha that had feelings for him, so getting them all pregnant would be difficult. Rukia's thing was that she knew how to rule a house and be a lady to her lord and husband, as such she wanted Naruto to know that she also understood his duty to his clan and title, which meant he and the few non-exiled Uzumaki would have to bring it back, which meant he needed to have women that could love, support, and provide heirs for him to keep the clan alive. Thus, she was encouraging him to find more women to love, trust, teach to keep his back covered, and of course fuck and impregnate. It didn't hurt that she also knew that the Yuzumaki also had a servant house for the main house, and that the women, for lack of a better word, were also concubines for whichever group of the family they were assigned to and worked to keep them going. Those that weren't concubines were helping care for the children or elderly, the ones that had aged to the point Yuzumaki genes couldn't help anymore. That was where the majority of civilians without any real skills that joined the Yuzumaki clan ended up, though it was volunteer unlike what other clans would do. 
your choice was branch house, you learn or use a skill to help keep the whole of Yuzu going, or join the servant house with full knowledge of what each area entailed. Quite a few women who became servants were ex-royal concubines, former prostitutes, heartbroken women who wanted comfort or wanted to help with family, rape victims who were nursed back to health and wanted to repay the only way they knew how, and various others. They were free to leave the servant house at any time they wished whether to see other places or because they were getting married and some were married into the main house. Anyway, Ruki intended to re-establish that to ensure Naruto had outlets and comfort in many forms and ways. While not viewed as dignified, normal, or decent, Rukia didn't give a fuck and would help run her new family with her future husband, as she and he saw fit, anyone with a problem could fuck off or take up a blade and face them in combat. Either way, the complainers were going to shut up and leave her new family alone. Shaking those thoughts away to focus on the present, Naruto switched with a pillow and left Tsunami to sleep while he got up and showered before dressing and heading downstairs. Naruto made breakfast and set up everything while leaving a covered dish for Tsunami before he sat and relaxed until everyone was up and ready to go. An hour later had the groups, minus Tosin, Gerald, Triss and Anahana, heading for the bridge with Triss and Anahana protecting the house and Tosin and Gerald heading for Gato's mansion to handle things there. Naruto had made sure to explain to the Konoha group that Tsubuza and his group were no longer a threat and were joining Konoha. He mainly explained it to ensure no incidents occurred at the bridge. He also told them that he and Zabuza were going to have a sword fight for their own acknowledgement of who the better fighter was. Of course Kashina and Kakashi tried to lecture him on not telling them about his plans, but Naruto countered with the fact that he had nothing concrete to tell them until the Hokage responded. Then with the meeting, if he told them, one or more would have tried to tag along, and that would have put Zabuza's group on edge and made the meeting harder to be a success. Plus it wasn't like he needed help or protection from them, so what was the point? They also tried to talk him out of fighting Zabuza before he pointed out he handled Zabuza before so why worry about it. Ichiha understood since they knew Naruto the best of their two groups and he usually did things himself and only mentioned the action if it was a success or failure but never if he was waiting to see which it was. They still needed to fully catch up with him on things since it was clear that while the core of him was still the same, he had matured and changed in ways they'd yet to fully see. Everyone then broke from their musings as they reached a bridge and saw a thick mist over it and the workers knocked out and put carefully to the side. Naruto merely smirked as he walked forward before part of the mist cleared revealing Zabuza and crew, with Zabuza already having his blade ready. I'll thank you for not killing the workers, it would have been very unprofessional of you. Naruto stated as Haku and the Demon Brothers stepped away from the two and the Konoha group stayed back with Tazuna. Yeah well, I'll be a Konoha shinobi soon, no reason to start killing people who have no part of any of this. Zabuza stated since he was a professional after all. Naruto nodded before a seal on his arm glowed and he had glamdring in his hand, making many raise their eyebrows seeing the pristine blade and the fact Naruto was holding it easily with one hand. Naruto then gripped it tight and then held it over his head, pointing towards Zabuza, who raised his blade too near his head, with it pointing towards the sky. The two swordsmen just stared at the other before launching forward and clashed blades, resulting in a loud clang that made many twitcher cover their ears from the sound. The two then rebounded and swung again, locking blades together and then clashing again and again, with many being surprised that Naruto was holding his own against Zabuza and was easily matching him in strength. Unknown to the observers, Naruto was the aggressor despite the appearance, as he was adding more force and pressure each swing, and Zabuza was adapting to keep up and finding that his impressive physical strength was being hard-pressed to push back Naruto's blows. Of course, with the brutal near-cruel training Naruto put himself under, it wasn't that surprising to anyone who knew how he trained and fought. Oh sure, he could beat Zabuza right now without having any real trouble, but what fun would that be? He wanted to see fully what Zabuza could do and push him to become better. He was rumored to be an S-rank ninja at one point and then was reduced to A-rank for some reason, he wanted to bring out the S-rank ninja and see just what the Demon of the Mist could really do. Which is why instead of matching him, Naruto began being more aggressive pushing Zabuza back making him grit his teeth, come on, show me what the demon can do with a blade. Naruto stated with a grin as he continued to attack Zabuza. Zabuza grit his teeth as he met Naruto swinging with more intensity and muscle behind it. He could honestly say this was more fun than anything else as they didn't want to stop fighting. The rush of a worthy opponent, the feel of a battle you didn't know if you'd walk away from, the feeling of uncertainty of if you would win, and the fight being equal, for the most part, in terms of strength, only made him grin more at fighting a man that could keep pace with him so easily. When was the last time he felt like this? When was the last time he had fun in a fight that didn't involve spilling a lot of blood? When was the last time he had a straight-up fight with swords that made his blood rage for more? Too long was the answer. Zabuza broke from his musings as he had to duck a parried crosswing that would have taken his head if he hand. 
He was unprepared for the boot that came up under his chin, sending his head snapping back and made him stumble back as he tried to shake the cobwebs away. Looking up, with his bandages having some blood on them now, he saw Naruto standing there with his blade resting on the shoulder with a smirk. Zabuza grinned beneath his bandages before he launched at Naruto again letting them clash again and again. The others could only watch enthralled at the dance of death that seemed to be before them. While not elegant in a sense given the blades and the brutality in which both were fighting, it was still something to be seen. To Itomi and Kishina, it was obvious Naruto was holding back against Zabuza, most likely to keep the fight against Zabuza going for his own fun. It was clear to everyone that Naruto was sufficiently trained given the way he moved and used the sword against Zabuza. However, Kishina couldn't stop the nagging feeling that she knew that blade and the blade he used before, she just didn't know why. She hadn't seen them before, she knew that for a fact, but she couldn't shake the feeling that she should know the blades, even if she hadn't ever seen them before. She just didn't understand why. Unknown to her, Arashi and Kiwan felt the same way only to a lesser extent. Though that was only because they were only half Yuzumaki in blood and spirit. The reason for the feeling was because Glamdring, Orchrist, and Acharn called out to those of Yuzumaki blood. However, theirs was dulled because they were blood traitors to the clan, granted the two half-breeds could be slightly excused because they weren't fully taught the Yuzumaki ways in full, but they still should have felt their blood shouting at them not to abandon family no matter what. The call wouldn't be as strong as it was for Naruto unless they somehow became worthy to become clan head, but that was unlikely given the rules and laws set with the Yuzumaki. Even disregarding their treatment of him, intentional or not, there were still the political, familial, spiritual, loyalty, and combat ways that you had to know to the last detail and be an expert in. Naruto had been given a slight pass when he became clan head, as he was the only Uzumaki to return and handle the debt of both clansmen and invaders, as well as refusing to commit sacrilege in the main temple by desecrating the statue that protected the rosary and staff and refusing to call himself clan head unless he truly was. The items had filled his mind with the basics, but Naruto had read through every scroll, book, text, and procedure for the Uzumaki clan rites, trainings, practices, and worship, and memorized them all, along with the rules, laws, and edicts connected them. To sum it up, Naruto knew every last piece of history, combat, sealing, religion, law, ethics, procedures, construction, and everything else that had to do with the Uzumaki clan down to the last letter of it. Naruto would be amazed if Kashina knew even a quarter of it or at least remembered even close to that much. To the point though, there were no other Yuzumaki left that knew all their clan ways, thus Naruto was the only true clan head left, and as such it was his duty to uphold all the clan laws and procedures, as well as teach any Yuzumaki that needed to learn their ways, so long as they didn't break the number one rule. You never abandon family unless they were traitors to the Yuzumaki way. There was no forgiving that act, even if you showed full repentance for your actions you were only allowed into the branch or servant house never the main house, thus certain rites and techniques were barred from you, and you'd reflect your new status. It wasn't even that Naruto or the past clan heads had a choice in their execution of punishments. They had to give that punishment or they risked greater harm on the clan. The reason was because the Uzumaki bloodline, meaning their family line not any bloodline limits in the clan, as a whole was part of a pact made with the Shinigami, hence him being their major deity that they prayed to. If you broke the laws of the clan then you dishonored the pact and Shinigami as a result, thus your own blood would reflect that, hence the term blood traitor, as they literally betrayed the blood in their veins, and the blood would in turn betray them. It was why the Uzumaki never cared if a blood traitor was recruited by another village, as their bloodline was tainted, and as such their heirs and the like were tainted as well. Now, if the heirs returned to Yuzu and swore fealty to the clan and passed a test, then they'd be welcomed back into the clan with open arms at the lowest rank of the main house and could work their way up. If their parents were truly sorry, their offspring could vouch for them and they'd be welcomed into the branch or servant houses. However, if they weren't punished, then the Uzumaki clan as a whole was punished for the transgression, and thus the culprit was to be punished, regardless of how heartless it seemed. This also led to the second most important rule of the clan. The clan as a whole was more important than any lower number of members. The clan as a whole was to be protected over 1, 10, or even 50 members, regardless of the reason for it. Thus even if the member was remorseful immediately afterwards, they still had to be punished. It was harsh, but then so was the world they lived in. So, even if Kashina and her children were truly and utterly remorseful in their actions and Naruto would forgive them completely, he still had to exile them from the clan, as that was what the law required. The Shinigami has helped build the laws when the pact was made, and the pact was the basis for the laws. Naruto wasn't going to let his clan suffer because three people decided they were going to try and plead for forgiveness for what they did. The only reason Naruto and probably the other still living members of the clan weren't feeling the effects of their betrayal was because the Shinigami knew what Naruto had planned and decided to hold off on letting the pact's negative effect kick in. 
This was due to Naruto having to follow procedures to publicly announce their exile. In his heart and blood, they were exiled which was good enough for Shinigami right now, so long as he did do the public declaration when he was able. The public part was so they knew their crimes and the punishment for said crimes. Now, if they had unknowingly hurt the clan, that was another matter entirely as it occurred with no intention to break the rules or betray the clan. Hence why Tsunade was safe from Naruto's ire, as she honestly was just too busy to do anything for him. It wasn't she neglected and abandoned him as she only saw him the same time as his siblings, unless he visited her at the hospital. How could it be neglect aimed at him when she treated the others of the clan the same way? She wasn't abandoning her clan or family, it was just she was so busy saving lives and training others to do so that she couldn't spend time with them, thus she was spared the punishment. The others? Not so much. Back to the fight, Zabuza was against the railing of the bridge due to leaping back from a cleaving strike done by Naruto. He then jumped on the railing as Naruto came at him with a sweeping attack and jumped away as he panted. Naruto hadn't let up in his attack even once and was always ready for when Zabuza tried to turn the fight in his favor. It seemed unreal that someone less than half his age could match him so well with a blade. Granted Zabuza hadn't had a real sword fight in years while well, Naruto had them daily up until less than two weeks ago. Naruto casually stepped up onto the railing and held his blade at his side before the two started clashing again creating sparks and more clangs as they fought on the railing. However, it was clear Zabuza had a bit more trouble keeping his footing, most likely due to the weight of Kubikarumjum. Luckily it wasn't a problem for long as he had to dive back onto the bridge to dodge another guillotine swing from Naruto, and everyone was shocked to see the blade sink into the concrete with little resistance. Naruto merely slid his blade out before dropping to the bridge and faced Zabuza. However, he had to frown as he turned towards the opposite end of the bridge before he raised his blade and blocked a small barrage of kunai that were thrown at him. Naturally, this put everyone on edge, and Haku and the Demon Brothers quickly moved away from the mist. Zabuza then released some of it to let it show some ninja of aim, and a small group of ronin, and one in particular had Naruto's interest. Aoi Rakusho, the traitor of Konoha that stole the rage in no ken. That was an issue for Naruto since that blade belonged to Taburama Senju, Tsunade's granduncle and cousin to his clan, which meant that blade was property of Tsunade and possibly the Uzumaki, and thus he was going to beat the man until he understood his mistake. However, Glamdring was not the right choice, which was why he sealed it away and called a charn out, I'll take Aoi, you lot can handle the others. Naruto stated as he pointed his hand at Zabuza, and a light hit Zabuza, making him feel energized and healing the few injuries he had. Zabuza merely blinked before moving a bit and grinned as Naruto approached Aoi with a charn in his hand. Ha. Huh. Look at this naive brat. Do you know what I hold? The almighty weapon of the second Hokage. The rage in no ken. Aoi bragged making Naruto just look at him in boredom, while the others with Aoi went around the men went for the others. You're an idiot. Naruto stated calmly while looking at Aoi as he twirled a charn in his hand. Aoi scowled at him for the remark, you and many others make the mistake of thinking that just because you have a legendary weapon that you automatically win, and you're an absolute idiot for that line of thinking. Naruto stated as he merely looked at Aoi and ignored the sounds of combat behind him, knowing the others would be alright. Aoi grit his teeth before lunging at Naruto with an overhead strike ready and grinned as the blade came down on Naruto as he blocked with a charn. However, the grin left him and was replaced with shock as Naruto was unharmed by the blade, even as electricity crackled over his blade. I am possible. This is the rage in no ken. No blade can match it. Aoi shouted in denial as a few looked over and were surprised too. Of course, the Achiha and Zabuza's group used the enemies being distracted to kill them quickly and help finish off the others. As I said, you're nothing but a fool. Naruto stated before he punched Aoi in the gut, making the man lurch forward and puke up blood and his stomach contents as Naruto side stepped to ensure he wasn't wearing the bile and blood. Naruto didn't act on Aoi's condition, he just stood there waiting before Aoi finally got up though it was shaky at best and he would fall over with a good enough push. Why you're G going to pay for that? Aoi stated as Naruto just looked at him in boredom before he blocked another sloppy slash from the blade and then another and another. It was very clear that Aoi only swung it around and thought he'd win. No discipline, no practice, no form, no tactical use, just swinging around and hoping to hit the target. Naruto then blocked a slash and pushed the lightning blade to the side before backhanding Aoi across the face, sending him to the ground again as Naruto just stood there. See, you idiots always think that a big fancy blade will make you invincible, same with those that think some flashy jutsu or bloodline will keep them alive. Let me tell you, it counts for shit when you've got an opponent with better skill, technique, and power than you. Naruto stated standing there while Lacharn was still in his hand. Aoi tried to get up only to fall again, and his nose and mouth were bleeding as he got up. 
he glared at Naruto and swung again only for Naruto to take his wrist, and in a flash a charm cut through his forearm with a wound being cauterized right after. Aoi fell to his knees screaming in pain clutching his new stump of an arm, while Naruto took the blade from the hand and tossed the hand into the water below. Naruto then twirled both blades in his hands before stabbing diagonally down through Aoi's shoulders and twisted the blades before tearing them out and decapitating him. Naruto stood there a moment before kicking the body off the bridge into the water below and deactivated the rage in no ken before pocketing it and then sealing Aoi's head. Naruto then resealed a charn and flexed his hands before he started to walk back to the others but had to pause as he caught a crossbow bolt fired at him. Turning to its direction, Naruto frowned as he saw Gato and an army of thugs and mercenaries there. However, the frown was because one goon next to Gato was holding Inari's head in the air and Gato was sporting a bandage on his face. HMPH, clearly those rain ninja were overrated to lose without event taking one of you with them. No matter, it saves me some money, and now you all will lose to these fine gentlemen standing beside me. Gato stated while Tazuna scowled at him with tears flowing from his eyes at the loss of his grandson, how does it feel Tazuna? To know that your grandson is dead because he took after your shit for brains. The little brat actually thought he could kill me with one of my men's blades when we caught him in the village. Gato sneered gloated knowing the brat had gotten close to killing him if it wasn't for the fact that one of his men was right there next to him to stop it. Now boys, kill the men, but take the females hostage. They could provide some entertainment before I sell them off. Beto stated with a laugh as the men all grinned before they froze as a cold chill went down their spine and it was from the aura Naruto was giving off. Now, you're going to die painfully. Naruto stated with a cold tone as he brought Orcrist out again before he started walking with the tip dragging against the bridge and leaving a cut as he went. The thugs and mercenaries all gulped before they charged right at Naruto. The first five to reach Naruto were hit by a swing of Naruto's sword, cutting them all in half, as he kept walking before he looked towards the horde and vanished from sight, shocking everyone even the Achiha, who hadn't turned off their Sharingan yet. All they could see were flashes of light and brief images of Naruto, as he cut down every thug and mercenary that got in his way with ruthless and clean strikes. Decapitations. Amputations. Dissections. Trisections. Topping them in two. Cutthroats. Arteries cut. Dismemberment. And more as Naruto cut through them all before reaching Gato as all the meat shields were dead and it was just the midget who was cowering and backing away in fear. Naruto, however, just grabbed him by his jacket and took his cane before dragging him through the blood, guts, bile, and shit and walked towards Tazuna. The others wisely chose to move out of his way as he walked before he dropped the midget of a man before Tazuna and offered him said midget's cane to beat the man to death. Tazuna took the cane and then began to make Gato regret ever daring to come to wave country or touching his family. One week later. A week later now had the groups, now including Tazuna and Tsunami, getting ready to leave Wave and go back to Kanoha with all of Wave seeing them off. However, they also had six other female Togalongs named Kitlea, Branwen, Lilith, Aya, Alva and Bellamere, all of whom were rescued from Gato's mansion by Tosin and Gerald. Thankfully, they were new acquisitions to Gato's slaves and thus hadn't been touched yet. A small mercy if there was one. The six had been given clothes and freed before they talked to Tosin and Gerald and then Naruto, Anahana, and Triss and decided to go with them both to get out of Wave and to maybe settle down in Konoha since they each had skills that could prove useful, both to Konoha and possibly to Naruto if they got his attention to be added to his clan. As for the others, after the bridge fight, Naruto and the others had gone back to the house with Naruto, leaving a couple clones to clean the bridge and watch over the workers. Naruto had relieved Tazuna of the responsibility of telling Tsunami, who broke down in tears as he held her with Anahana, and Triss comforted her too. Apparently, Inari had gone to see a friend in town that morning without telling anyone and was captured on the way home, as he had been to his friend's house and left. Anyway, Tsunami was offered a place in the clan back in Kanoha if she wished it along with Tazuna, done in private of course, and Naruto had spent every night laying in bed with Tsunami holding her. It was the fifth day when Tsunami stated she wanted to go with him and they made love on her bed for hours as Tsunami wanted to just feel nothing but a pleasure and wanted something, anything, to take her mind off of her son's death. Coincidentally it was also the same day Naruto had buried Inari for her aunt Izuna and made a grave marker as he put Inari right next to Kaiza and made sure some flowers would grow over the graves. Tsunami would be joining the servant house and attending to Naruto's family, while Tazuna was going to help Naruto with something he wanted built, and Tazuna stated he was going to either stay in the village or do some sightseeing across the countries. The reason for the latter was Inari always used to talk about leaving Wave to see different countries and sites, and coming back to Wave to tell others what he had seen and experienced. Tazuna may have been pushing into the elderly category, but he still wanted to do something with his life besides drinking. 
Plus, there was always someone in need of a skilled builder, so why not? No one of Wave blamed Tazuna or Tsunami for wanting to leave Wave. The loss of Inari's father, Tazuna's wife, then Kaiza, and now Inari combined with the overall suffering and living in fear, just made them hit the breaking point. The fact that Tazuna had beaten Gato's head until it was like a deflated balloon and had stabbed his torso and genitals with the pointed part of the cane until not even an academy training dummy could compete with the number of holes just showed how much rage Tazuna had been harboring and getting the chance to vent just made it easier for him. They were wished the best of luck and that they'd have people watching over and taking care of their home should they ever want to come back to wave. Azuna had helped convince many others to go along with Naruto's plans for the country, and with the funds that Geralt and Tosin returned to them all, they'd be able to help him fund his projects and plans. The fact that he delivered Gato into the very vengeful hands of Tazuna only further spurred them to help him, especially if he could use the information to stop other pigs like Gato from ruining other homes and families. Plus, with all the help he and his group had done for the people, it only made it easier to decide to help him. Naruto had informed them that an associate of his would be coming to Wave to handle the business of managing and passing along the information to him. The Kanoha groups, of course, had their suspicions on why Tazuna and Tsunami were coming with them, but Kishina kept it civil and non-invasive, since she could see things through Tsunami's view. She couldn't imagine what would happen to her if she lost her husband, mother, and lover, and then lost her only child to a monster of a man that would gladly rape her until she was nothing more than a piece of meat and having to fear he would come after her, her child, or her father. Kishina would probably have gone on a rampage killing and destroying everyone and thing in her way to get to her target, but she was a Kanoichi with training and kills under her belt, so her response was normal. But for a civilian woman who just had to cope and try to keep what family she still had. She'd never set foot in the country where she lost everything. Besides, she wasn't blind, there was definitely something going on between Tsunami and her eldest, but again she wasn't going to pry or go protective mother, since really what good would it do her right now? Furthermore, what good would it do Tsunami? For now she'd keep quiet, but back in Kanoha she and her family needed to talk to Naruto and clear the air between them all. She wanted her family whole again, she wanted to get to know the man that was her son, she wanted to know the women that had won his heart, she wanted to start making it up to him to let him know how sorry they all were. Unfortunately for her, she was too little too late for any of that. And by the time she did learn it, she'd be out of the clan and have no connection to her son any longer beyond birthing him into this world. What if Yuzumaki clan members see lol chakra and temple for Naruto, and thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel, and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.